بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Uh, so I'm Ishraq from Empower Change, and this is a series of trainings that was brought together by Care SF, Polygon, and Empower Change here at MCC and also at Oakland. Uh, so we're going to be doing parallel trainings for the next several weeks. Uh, this is the first training in a series of three. This is We're going to be covering grassroots organizing and community organizing principles. Next week, we're going to be covering uh, legislative advocacy and how to engage with your elected officials at the federal level. And then the last week, which I don't think it's actually, it's the first weekend of August, uh, will actually be listening sessions so that we can actually dive in and talk about some of the issues that are, uh, people in the community are concerned about, and that will be facilitated by Care SF. The whole idea of this, this series of trainings by these three orgs is that we really want to be able to build, start building some civic engagement and some organizing power within our communities. We know that we're not in a kind of time vacuum. This is 2019. We have a big election coming up, 2020. Something like that. Uh, and that we, want, we don't want to be in a situation like it was in 2016 at the national level or even after uh, 2004, 2008, or right after 2001 as well. Uh, we want to be in a situation where we have the tools and we have the kind of understanding of how we effectively engage at the national level, but more so from my end and Empower's end is how do we continue to do our work and build power and continue to organize in off years outside of uh, like national elections. Um, so with that, Jazakallah Khair, thank you for coming through and I think we will um, get started. Uh, so just by a show of hands, who here is familiar with Empower Change? Okay, cool. We have a, a, few, a handful of folks, one of them being a plant in the crowd, my wife. Uh, but uh, so for folks who don't know, Empower Change is a digitally native uh, grassroots Muslim organization. That's kind of jargony, but digitally native basically means that we do a lot of online organizing, very similar to Move On, United We Dream, Color of Change, where what we do is that we understand that, you know, based on our limited resources, how is it that we can maximize our outreach? And we realize that the digital space is a place that we can really engage a lot of individuals across political geographies to be involved in issues that we think are important and that also people tell us are important. Uh, so in that vein, we do a lot of digital advocacy. We'll be doing petitions, driving phone calls, and coordinating like distributed mobilizations around issues that are important to us. Uh, but myself, uh, I came on board in about a year and a half ago to build out the fields team. So back, uh, going, rewinding a little bit uh, more, Empower Change had started at the end of 2015 uh, with three founders, one of which was from the Bay Area. So our executive director, Linda Sarsour, is one of the co-founders of this organization. Dustin Cron, who is from Berkeley, from the Bay Area, was the other co-founder. And then Mark Crane, who is actually a Muslim organizer at um, Move On. So the three of them had envisioned, you know, what's the, like a way that we can capture um, and engage Muslims nationally. And they imagine that this digital platform is the way to go. And so last year, um, around the, so no, not last year, in 2017, uh, Empower had been building up a bit of their digital advocacy work. And so we had been on front on issues around labor practices with Amazon, healthcare rights, and uh, support around a dream and DACA. Uh, after the 2016 election, and this is kind of segging into how I got involved, my wife and I, we were in Los Angeles, after, on the night of the elections, what, what night was that, November 7th, 2016, we were in downtown LA in my office do, watching the kind of results, and we're, you know, we're three hours behind the East Coast, we started seeing results coming in, uh, and at that night, Mayor Garcetti, the mayor of LA, was having a huge watch party at one of the, like, one of the spaces in downtown LA. We left my office to go down there, and we started seeing gradually the mood of the, the city. LA is pretty liberal in downtown LA. People were just kind of like literally in a drunken stupor, like, oh my god, we just lost the country. And so it was kind of interesting to see that. Um, and that night, my boss, who's a, a, black, a black woman who's an attorney at an advocacy organization, was like, you know, Ishraq, I had a bad feeling about this election. I think this is going to be make, it, make it a bit more difficult for people of color within this country. So that was the prelude to uh, November 2016. In those months between November through March, April 2017, my wife and I were approached by several Muslims that were active in LA in uh, you know, coming to a rally, signing a petition, maybe going to City Hall. And they asked us and a few others, what is it that we, we heard you're an activist. 
what's the work that we can do uh, to be more engaged uh, beyond just going to a rally and just driving phone calls? So I, you know, was thinking, oh, I really, I'm not sure what we should do. We, I have a group of Muslim leaders that's saying that they want to do some work. What do we do? So I did, uh, the, I just checked my network and I know a Muslim community organizer at a group called LA Voice. So she had been doing grassroots work and, and like really kind of getting into the local issues of what was happening in LA. So we were doing work around prison reform, affordable housing, and uh, better funding for public education. She told me, Ishraq, you should just treat this like an organizing, like listening session and just start developing leaders. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So we started a small group called Muslim Band Together. And literally, this was like a second full-time job for me, outside of my regular job. We were just you know, having phone calls and conferences with the other organizers. What's the kind of trajectory and the ladder of engagement that we want to like, uh, instill on this group of 20 to 25 individuals that, came, that asked us like, organically, what do we do? And so it was around this time that uh, Empower changed because I'm originally from New York. Uh, Linda and I had worked together on some immigration campaigns and some electoral campaigns. She was saying that, hey, we might actually have an opportunity for you to come down to Empower. Empower being a digital organization. And I'm like, you know, digital work for me is like something that I know how to send e-blasts out, set, set up some events. But I, my heart was doing relational work and kind of getting people to dig in uh, to like, uh, local issues. And so she was like, you know, we have an opportunity to take our online base and bring them into offline work. Do you want to be a part of that? Do you want to start training individuals? And I'm like, no brainer. I think that would make sense given that I could stay in LA and not have to move to New York. But the, the trick was that I have to be traveling uh, places uh, to do these trainings. Uh, so that's how I came to Empower Change. Uh, and a little bit more about uh, my background and my kind of uh, credentials for organizing. I started out, I was a teenager in New York when 9-11 happened. I, the first thing that I saw in my community was um, that there was deportations happening, particularly in the Bangladeshi community in Long Island. And that, you know, my uncle from Atlanta actually called, and this was indicative of what was happening in the island. Ishraq, you guys should shorten your last name Ali to Al and put an American flag on your front door so that nobody would, um, like, you know, you won't face harassment. For some reason, as like a 16, 17 year old, that didn't sit well with me. I read Malcolm X at that time and I'm like, okay, what's the work that needs to, like, how do we kind of express our Muslim identity and continue to build power. These are the ideas that I was thinking about as a teenager. And then fast forwarding into college, I really, like uh, Sister Zarina mentioned, agenda to change our condition and the importance of, you know, as a Muslim responsibility for us to be uh, involved in being active change makers in our communities. I got that kind of uh, understanding through mass. Muslim American society really taught me that, you know, in order for me to be a good Muslim, I also have to improve the communities around me. And so fast forwarding six years in Boston, I got really involved in local campaigns around security guard, security guard worker rights, capping interest rates on banks that were being predatorial in low income communities. And this is kind of what laid the foundation for me saying that, oh, you know what? Organizing is not just photo ops, but it's about getting into the issues that are impacting the community. No matter how like gray and boring it may look on paper, these were things that were impacting large scales of people. And so that's kind of what brought me into organizing and therefore I started training as an organizer. I moved to Chicago, I organized there for about a year and then I went back to New York where I grew up and organized there for several years doing electoral work, affordable housing work and we did a lot of uh, work around foreclosures and affordable housing work within Queens and Long Island. Uh, and then, you know, jumping to LA, I needed a break uh, from the gritty New York work and I ended up uh, in Los Angeles and got pulled back into the work, alhamdulillah, right after uh, the elections. So. I will stop there on who we are at Empower Change and what I'm about. And I would love to just do like a quick go around of uh, individuals to say your name, uh, where you're from in terms of like where, what geography you're from here. And then just a quick line of like what actually made you interested to come to this training. We'll actually start on my right. Got it. Just like
Got it. Okay. Okay. Mm. 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 Got it. Sure. Got it. And then vet out Empower to see if we're. I'm gonna wait up here. Yeah. Oh, sure. That's actually the most smart. Oh, shoot. All right. Uh, my name is Brandon Remsen, and um, I'm a new Muslim uh, here at the community center, um, native of the Bay Area. Um, currently residing in, in Hayward. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a board member with the uh, Interfaith Council of Alameda County mm -hmm. and social justice issues have always been very important to me and um, my community and my family um, and I just uh, saw this as an opportunity to to build my skills and um, and yeah that's about it. I thought you could Uh, my name is Zarina Sololu. Uh, I'm a social act, act, activist already. I've been doing this for the past three years. I read um, Hamza Yusuf and uh, Zay Shocker's book. Uh, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Agenda to Change Our Condition. And that was just a transforming for me three, four years ago. I'm a housing commissioner for City of Pleasanton. So uh, my passion when I was here as a board member a few years ago was uh, affordable housing and what's happening to the poor communities and, and people getting homeless and um, uh, gentrification of the neighborhood. So I got more involved with that and I see that as an issue that we have to, we have a crisis in, the, in this state uh, with lack of affordable housing and people are being displaced and moved into being homeless. Um, so if we, if we as a Muslims want to make a change, we have to start working on the local issues. We cannot just come back and talk about Islamophobia. We cannot just talk about Uyghur cause. We cannot talk about anything unless we are involved in, in including other people in the community which are making alliances with the Jews, making alliances with the Christians. So that's where I have been. Actually, I got a lot of my training from the Genesis of Oakland um, because they're the ones who are activists and they know how to do this. They've been organizing for many generations. So I had to learn from the experts. So uh, Alhamdulillah, I learned quite a bit. 
but still moving the Muslim community is very difficult and um, I wish and I would want to see more Muslims involved because that's what we're here for. I believe we're here for a reason to make the lives of others better. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to do it if we're just sitting at home? Sound like I'm everyone. My name is Sara. Um, I'm Ishraq's wife. Um, I also do advocacy at a different organization. Um, my organization is not faith-based, um, and you know we don't only work or specifically work with Muslims, um, but have similar approach to organizing. And it's really exciting to see, you know, that advocacy and activism um, growing in our community. But definitely agree with Sister Zarina. There's so much more more to go. So really grateful for all of you guys taking time out of your Saturday morning to be here. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is We Am and we live in Berkeley. Um, I guess recently I've been like more aware about um, race and like othering in our society. Like even in the Bay Area we're not immune. Um, so I guess I'm here today to just learn more about what we can do to empower each other and um, our societies. <laughs> Assalamualaikum, I'm Rashid, um, so I live with her in Berkeley. Um, very early in my social, civic activism uh, phase of my life, but I do definitely want to get involved more. Um, I, think, I think probably just being in Berkeley has kind of instilled that, uh, that desire in me. Um, I do think that we are at a critical time in our country, in our in the world, where we can have a lot of impact, uh, and it's important for me to form a sense of community wherever I go, um, and it's important to, uh, you know, um, put our faith in action. And I'm just generally interested in learning more about how we can do that. I'm also Bangladeshi American, sure. and I have family. Like I come from the East Coast. I come from the East Coast, um, and you might know some of them. They're in Long Island. Oh wow, we probably do know a lot of yeah. some of folks. And also something. Uh, how far is Berkeley from here? It takes about like forty minutes. Yeah, like forty. So I appreciate y'all coming out. Um, you know, uh, my colleague, who's arguably the like the the MVP of the organizing from Kif Asha, also got her bones in, in Berkeley and her taste in activism there too. Maybe we'll just have yourself and then Adnan also. Assalamualaikum everyone. My name is Farhan. Uh, also went to school with Kifa, so I've got my organizing bones there. Well, I think both of us probably got it a bit earlier than that when you grow up in the Bay Area. There are seeds. Um, yeah, so I am actually a board member for Polygon, who's putting on the training next week on legislative advocacy. Um, our uh, president is going to be flying in from DC to give that training, alhamdulillah. Um, I uh, have always, I guess, uh, been uh, involved uh, peripherally in some sense, whether at Berkeley. I also worked for the city of San Francisco for a while, so was uh, on the inside, actually working um, on a lot of uh, different uh, consulting projects for the city, including working with the police department during a time when there was a lot of uh, really bad stuff that the police was getting coverage for uh, nationally. So it was, it was interesting thinking about how one can make change from side, so to speak. Um, I also uh, uh, went to graduate school for um, public policy, and I've uh, always kind of had this on my mind. I worked on the midterm elections in Arizona um, this past cycle, um, uh, which was ended up being one of the closest races in the country. So it really was, I think, that opportunity for me to say, hey, let's, um, I know that if I need want to help organize the Muslim community, I need to, uh, as many people said, need to help organize um, outside of my community and then also see how I can bring those skills back in. Um, so with that, I'll pass it to Adnan. Uh, I'm Adnan. Um, I've been involved in uh, voluntary activities throughout my life. I've been an active member of Greenpeace earlier in my undergrad and others, but I've never been involved in civic engagement, so anything to do with politics or because growing up, uh, it was considered bad. It was so I've been extremely passive throughout. Do everything you can, but stay away from politics, stay away from civics. It's not for you. Uh, so I joined. Uh, I met Salal Bakri in Belmont eight years ago. He'd been pushing me, nudging me, and finally, I think he got hold of me. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, he called me. He's like, "Nan, <laughs> there's one happening in Pleasanton just beside you. 
I couldn't uh, s switch my schedule much, uh, but I was able to come in. And I'm, uh, I just want to learn and how to get into this and how to uh, learn the process of getting involved. And I would be remiss, Hassan has been the MVP. He's been the one that's setting up the room and making sure that everything is going on. So if you want to just say a quick word of what brought you here, why are you up in the mornings? Assalamualaikum, brother. My name is Hassan. I work for the Muni Brother. I'm the assistant and facilitator coordinator for the Masjid MCC. I'm always pleased to have um, coordinated a lot of events in Masjid, and uh, I'm very pleased that you all are here attending the programs. And I'm also looking forward to uh, I've been involved in politics in, when I was in college, uh, but then I changed my career, you know, and I worked with, uh, like, Pete Stark, the congressman in Fremont for, like, about 12 years. I was helping him in, uh, in uh, like, sort of, like, translations and all this other stuff that Afghan people and inshallah, this will be a definitely a good program that would the, the people that are attending here would definitely would be benefits, inshallah. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so just uh, as he's been doing khidma for us, let's make sure we do khidma for the jami as well. Let's just clean up our materials as well uh, when we take breaks and wrap. So great. I appreciate everybody sharing a little bit. I think that just kind of helps me warm up and understand where folks are at. Um, and we get to know each other a little bit. So let's jump in. Uh, so why community organizing and why uh, we do, uh, why Empower kind of approaches this with a certain model? For us, we understand that community, oh, I should run that. Cool, no worries. We'll jump that back. Cool. So with us, community organizing is one kind of tool in your toolbox of doing advocacy work or just being uh, active in public life. Uh, we believe that, you know, this is not the kind of, cure all thing to like resolve all issues, but we do believe that there's a lot of lessons to be learned within community organizing, particularly around the second point of being relational and leveraging relational power. Um, and with that, I think is if there's one thing that we could come away with from this training is that you know we have to like make an effort to be a bit more relational before we go public and go political. And then lastly for us, what makes Empower Change ultimately different or you know distinguishes us from different organizing groups? Uh, I'm not the only Muslim organizer in this field nationally, of course, and we're like, we are not necessarily unique from other faith communities of drawing from our own faith principles of why we organize. Uh, but we realize that, you know, in this kind of diasporic context, uh, for a lot of the Muslim, uh, several of the Muslim organizers that I work with that are uh, from an immigrant base, we realize, you know, we're drawing from Christian and Jewish values that have actually put us into professional organizing. But what do we have within our own kind of wealth and our own literature and our own kind of history that connects us to why we should be relational, why we should build power? And I'm hoping that we can cover a bit of that today. So uh, quickly with some ground rules, this is a small group, but this is uh, just a few things that I'd love uh, folks to um, be mindful of. Uh, so being present, can somebody, let's just do this popcorn style. I'm not one for like hands and all that, but uh, when I say be present, what does that actually mean? Sure, and if you if you got to be on the phone, just uh, take it out. Like I'm not one to uh, tell people turn your phones off and don't be connecting to the outside world. But if you got to do that, just be mindful of this space and uh, respect each other's uh, time here. Asking questions, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I I love this to be interactive. That's like it's a little uncomfortable for me for to be behind a table. I like being in front of with folks. Uh, so just uh, the more you interact with me, the more I think I'll be able to. Uh, uh, engage y'all on the material as well. And then speaking from a place of I and sharing your experience and not being theoretical. What is that? Cool, thank you. Um, respecting difference of opinions. I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's something that I may also get caught up on, so I will look to my wife, actually. She'll ground me <laughs> to make sure that I don't do that. And then the, the next one is being patient with the facilitator. Um, that's just for my own uh, sanity. I know I'm, I like I've, as much, I've done this material a few times, but I just want to be sure uh, that folks know that all the trainers, and I speak on the other trainers that we've trained with, that everyone's human and has like a spectrum of expertise and all that. Uh, so being mindful of that. And feel free to also let me know that, hey, this does not actually like logically make sense what you've described. And then last thing is land the plane. 
What does that mean? Yeah, so uh, this is something, this is, I gotta give credit to the Chicago organizers. They're like, you know, when you're in public space, make your point, you can be elaborate, tell a story and all that, but be mindful of the space that you're taking from others and the space that you're creating, but uh, drive home your point. And so the idea is landing the plane. I may do this, but also as a facilitator, I might uh, just make some cues to say that, hey, like, let's wrap and move to the next point. Is there anything else from these ground rules or anything missing from these ground rules that folks would like to add? Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. Okay, that's a beautiful suggestion. Would you like to do that collectively as a group or should you? Yeah, Sure. Bilayna shaitani rajim. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar rahmani rahim. Maliki yomitin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Sirat al ladina anamta alayhim. Ghayri al maktubi alayhim. Wala tlalim. Amen. Jazakallah khair. So now um, at the piece that I want to go through is we folks spoke a bit about their experience and curiosity around activism and all that. I'd love to know what do these words mean to y'all and people can just shout out a word and tell me what they think. I'm going to try and capture this. Arfan, if you want to capture. So this will look like will work for you and we'll use this for the Perfect. Great. Try to pass this out around. So I just want to get a clearer sense. What do these words mean to folks or when they think of these words? Um, give me like a, a quick definition of them. Yep, you can pick pick any word and then we'll go with that. I just want to capture some ideas what folks were thinking. So yeah, so uh, community, for me, it's a sense of uh, belonging. Commonalities. Community for me means uh, the space we live in and the people we live in with, so that includes uh, different faith. Um, I'm living, so people around me, so my neighbors can be Muslim, non Muslim. And another sense of community is people of faith. And another sense of community is from where you come from. So say, for example, I'm from Pakistan, Pakistani American. So I will be more sometimes comfortable with people from Pakistan from the same faith hmm. and my local people. So we try to form a sense of community. Want to take notes? And my hand would Cool. So uh, is there, uh, it sounds, let's go to an, uh, another term. Let's go to relational. What does relational mean, folks? So relation means having a connection with others so that when you need that person to be behind you, you will have their backing. So it's a good relationship, for example, I think of rela relational is if I'm working with the church community and if I need them to come in, I should have enough uh, understanding and a good relationship, enough that if there's an issue dealing with Islamophobia or something, that I can count on them, that they will, uh, you know, they have my back and they'll come to the event that I asked them to come. And I, I think building relation, uh, uh, relations and, and power means you have them or, or bring the Muslim actually 
we should be back each other. So if there's something going on, I should be able to back everybody out, and that's having a relation, good relation. We have to be close enough. Yeah, Risa, to that question. Anybody else on relational? Um, I'd say the ability to connect and meet people where they're at. Yeah. I know there's like a famous quote that's like something like, the strength of our in independence is dependent upon our interdependence. So. Interdependence, yeah, that captures it. Cool. And maybe we'll just go down the line. How about power? Numbers. 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 That's what power is, gives it the human power. There's mm -hmm. the number. Power to me is often misunderstood and highly sought after for the wrong reasons. Misunderstood and sought after for the wrong reasons. Maybe we'll take one more in power. Influencing. Influencing leadership. Cool. Um, so now let's jump to the next term, community organizing. This might be a little on the nose, but I'm just curious. Um, strengths and capabilities. Got it. Cool. No strength. Mm. How would you? How do you describe? What would organized look like? Organized, I organized? mean that. that you, if you the community is together and they have some purpose and then they uh, with that they uh, go forward they will have a strength but otherwise the community can be scattered and mm -hmm. you have nothing going um, self-interest so in order to work on some of this stuff, uh, fortunately or, or unfortunately, you have to have a self-interest. It has to keep you going. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a self-interest and having a goal on site, you're going to lose sight of what you're trying to do. So it has to hit home. It has to be personal at that level. Uh, uh -huh. and, and it has to affect you in a way in order to have an interest. Got and it. you keep it going. Yeah. Others. Self-interest is a very important concept for us in work. Self-interest can be negative also, so you should be uh, watching yourself, whether it's only for your personal goals, m making money or fame or all that. So you have to really uh, understand what is the meaning behind it. Self-interest should have interest of the community also. Mm -hmm. It's only your own self-interest. Sometimes you can be more hurtful to the cause. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I think um, self-interest is often has that negative connotation, but politics is like the science of balancing self-interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or competing interests. Yeah. Um, so campaigns. Rehana, I know you you have some familiarity with it. What is a campaign? Yeah, maybe campaigns could be. I was trying to figure out how to word it more. Um, broadly, but um, could be a movement that has a common purpose and a, a, a particular philosophy that's driving everybody towards something. Mm -hmm. Sure. I would also chime in and say uh, something with a direct uh, an outcome in mind. Absolutely not. Yep. Brandon, were you going to say something? Words uh, that come in mind uh, with campaign, if you want to get this the specific and leave the broad, is uh, canvassing, mm -hmm. phone calling, uh, mobilizing, uh, all parts of any given campaign for an issue or an individual. Yeah. Um, I would just I would just say that uh, camp, uh, campaigning is a way to um, 
a, fu a function of organizing in a way that affects uh, community. Yeah, function of organizing. Great. I'll add one more here. Sure. Uh, often it's helpful to have a target, uh, whether that's a person or a, an organization or what it is, okay. some you know symbol. Cool. Uh, mobilization. And let's do mobilization and activism together. So that way, I'm going to review some of the our textbook definition on this. I think there's been some overlap. Someone, uh, so you had mentioned mobilization. Science of getting people to actually do what you yeah. want them to do at the end of the day, yeah. or uh, what the community wants to achieve. Yeah. Given that there is a community, given that there is a structure, given that there is a way to communicate and that relationships have been built and slowly you have a voice that will allow you to have power after you have finished community organizing. Yeah. So now I added all the words together. So people <laughs> that. Great. Um, to me, mobilization is inspiring other people to be on board with the cause that's like mutually beneficial. Yeah. And then lastly, we'll just take activism. Somebody give me a, I, I hear using good and bad connotation. So. I think activism to me is um, overly used, but not um, like carried through. What, uh, so what is not being carried through when you're saying? Uh, I think today um, I hear that like people saying like, are you an activist or I am an activist as if it's like like this label that uh, I think often is misunderstood even like by myself. Like what does it mean to be an activist and like why does one person deserve the title over another based on like their beliefs? It's mm. to me like more action oriented than beliefs, and I think that um, we're kind of like blurring the waters between those two. Sure. Yeah. And there's a relationship with them. So I'm going to, yeah, go right ahead, Salah. Salah had one comment here. No, go right ahead. Uh, uh, activism is at, at the essence is, is, is beliefs turned into action, right? Yeah. And, and this yearning desire to change. Uh, inside you, yeah. uh, change your condition or the issues you you, you believe in, um, as a reflection, if you may allow me, just a little bit. Um, in thirty years, Islam spread uh, much more than uh, was able to be accomplished by Christianity, or at least Roman Catholic Christianity, in five hundred years. Just in thirty years, much more, almost triple the size of how fast. The and I, I attribute to that, to the capacity of the Prophet Muhammad uh, instituting change, fundamental change in people and transformation on a certain level where he took people who were not activists and changed him into 100,000 activists. 80,000 of them died outside their home country making change, which is basically the, their biggest calling was actually social justice space and economic justice and uh, with underlying uh, environmental justice so in reality whenever i think of activism i think of uh, this religion actually yeah and it was supposed to be as opposed to where we at right now where almost zero activism because we have not gone through a process of transformation yes absolutely. and we'll actually touch upon some of those prophetic examples in a minute brother i just realized uh, we, uh, we haven't even introduced you. If you could just say your name and where you're coming from as well. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Abdullah. Um, I'm from Dublin. Okay. Okay. So, well, uh, I was just here for the uh, issue prayer last night, and I, you know, the uh, after the prayers, the announcement and, uh, about this program today here, and so I, I, although I can't say the whole time, but I said I'm just going to join in to see what it's all about. So. Okay. And we just had one more brother come in, and then we'll actually uh, give some of these textbook definitions. Uh, hi, what am I saying? Uh, your name. Name. 
where you're coming from and what brought you here. Okay, my name is Wahab. Um, I am coming from Oakland. And what brought me here was uh, honestly just politics over the last two years and wanting to make more of a difference rather than passively kind of learning about everything. So I appreciate folks as kind of uh, crowdsourcing some of these uh, definitions and these concepts. I, I Most of what you had discussed is what actually encompasses the definitions that I had. And I, like a fool, did not insert the slide on the textbook definition that I had, and I will share that <laughs> as a follow-up. But I want to share uh, some of them with you. So for people had said that with community, it's people that have a shared culture or share say, the same neighborhood um, and you know share some commonality there. We want to just kind of add a little bit to that definition and say that you know it's people who share a set of common values. So values uh, can be across faith traditions, can be across socioeconomic lines. If somebody cares for like the taking care of the the homeless or taking care of young students, they they share a common value. And we say that community is defined by people who share a set of common values. Um, and going to relational. Uh, as we get to know each other individually, and folks have mentioned that you know being relational is that somebody who will like support you based on your the relationship that you have with them, and it's getting the idea of being relational is that you've been able to identify where there's a common overlap of values. So it's based on someone's value that you have with them that they will be motivated to do the the work with you or take an action or to support you in whatever it is that you do. Um, Zarina mentioned power is the ability to uh, move. Uh, did you say people or resources? So the textbook organizing definition of power is the ability to act and the ability to move people and financial resources. So this is actually what and our scope of how we're defining power. Um, and then with community organizing, it's enlisting grassroots leaders to tackle and resolve public issues, local problems, and large-scale problems that are consistent, again, with our values. The, I keep honing back in on values and being relational. So I'm like, oh, well, there's two folks that can do that. It's, um, we are being relational means that we are able to connect with one another on our values or we've been able to articulate what our values are. And community organizing is being able to organize and mobilize individuals based on those, the values that you have around a specific issue or a cause. Uh, so with self-interest, this is a uh, concept that in many faith traditions, and I've seen this play out in both Christian and Jewish settings, people have a little bit of tension with this word. Uh, so for us, we try to say self-interest is within a spectrum. There's selfishness on one side, where you're only thinking about yourself as an individual, and then on the other extreme, what would that be? Selflessness, that you don't even consider your own values and your own kind of interest uh, to be a factor in your decision making. So self-interest is right down the middle where your personal values and your personal interests inform why you make certain decisions. And it's on this, and it's intention or in relationship with selflessness because you're also trying to see if your values and the issues that you care about are in alignment with the broader community that you belong to. Um, let's actually do a quick introduction of the two individuals that just came in. If you could just say your name, where you're coming from, and then what brought you to this training today. Pleasanton for almost 16 years now. Uh, been involved with the Masjid MCC for quite a while from the very beginning mm -hmm. on the board for the past, uh, this is my fourth year on the board. Okay. I serve, uh, I serve as uh, one of the directors here. So I believe for me, my community has been my number one uh, priority. Mm. Bringing up uh, overall service to the community because we are humans and uh, one of our foremost uh, purpose uh, being a Muslim and being human is to serve others and we can only do that with uh, proper channels knowing how to do it and I believe service is one way to reach Allah. Yes. We have one more brother. My name is Mosaddiq Velo. I live in San Ramon. I came from San Ramon today. Um, I saw the notice about this, but I'm interested in helping the community, but it didn't really click that much to me. But yesterday, at the khutbah, uh, yesterday in San Ramon, I saw VIC, 
press allowed in, I mean, mention this program, we can talk about the importance of mm. community organizing. So I said, I'll, I'll try to do that. Just a thought, welcome. And so going back to our uh, definition, did we just cover community organizing? So enlisting grassroots leaders and all that. Oh, self-interest as well. So next campaign, um, Farhan mentioned this, that it's, you know, say, setting a goal and working towards it, or there's an element of that. For us, we define a campaign. It may be an electoral campaign where you have to do phone banking, where you have to canvas, but more so a campaign is something where you have a set goal that you're working towards, and you've outlined a process towards it, and that you've also created a specific timeline, that your campaign is going to be for the next six months. It's going to start on January 1st, end on June 30th. This is what we're going to do for every month in that process, and we're going to see if we can get to that goal. It does not necessarily mean that we may achieve our goal, and I think it's indicative in electoral campaigns. People are working for a set time. Election day is the day that they can determine whether or not their campaign is successful. So for us, a campaign is setting a goal, working within a specific timeline, and articulating a process towards it. And once that campaign is done, this is really important for organizers, community organizers, is you evaluate if the goal was achieved. So if you've achieved it, you kind of want to really capture what went well during that campaign. What are things that you can do to improve? And then if, it did not, the, if you did not achieve your goal, then you also run that same kind of evaluation method. What went well? What are the things that we can learn from this campaign that we've engaged in for the next campaign that we want to work on? And then thinking strategically, what are the things that we need to change? And so for organizers, we often think that any kind of campaign, any kind of action that we want to do that's time bound and that requires a process, we treat it as a campaign. And we always recognize that you know campaigns may have wins or losses. We want to make sure that we're learning the lessons so that we're kind of pushing to the next, um, uh, learning, uh, impl applying those lessons to the next campaign. Mobilization, uh, we mentioned it's moving people to action. So that may be that you, know, you have a, a group of highly invested leaders that are going to be in the action from 6 AM, making sure that they're set up to closing and breaking down an action or a rally or whatever it is. But a mobilization in and of itself is being able to move large groups of people towards an action. Um, and activism, and this is the definition that we are still dancing with in Empower, it's an individual or somebody that's invested and cares about their community. And the, the care that they have for the community is, again, tied to their values. And their values are what's going to be uh, driving them to be active to build power. And does that make sense for folks? Cool. So now we're going to uh, jump in a little bit of how, the, how our faith values inform some of these concepts and how we actually use this to engage with the communities around us. Um, I'm actually going to jump into, uh, what slide did I actually have? Got it. So we are actually, subhanAllah, uh, uh, who here is uh, familiar with the Hilful Fudul? Would you like to give a quick summary of what that was? And then I'll add to it. Yeah, and I will uh, speak in a second. So there is, uh, as folks may know, that uh, you know, folks would come to Mecca to do trade. There was a man who was actually involved in the trade union and not receiving wages. And he had actually fought, fought the Christians who was complaining at the Kaaba, saying that, you know, I have been wronged by the Quraysh. Um, so there was an agreement made that, you know, we are going to honor the rights of people that come in. I, and he may have been somebody that was a poor class and was really trying to work for him. And Muhammad ibn Nasir called him. Uh, the man that was involved in the trade dispute. And so the, the pact was that 
both sides, that they would side, uh, the corporation would side with the oppressed, against the oppressor, regardless of the tribe of affiliation. And even if the one who is shown injustice is from a faraway tribe and the oppressor, uh, the oppressor is Quraysh, they will get the rights for the oppressed against the oppressor. And so this, uh, and the Prophet said that, you know, I, uh, he had witnessed in the House of Abdullah bin Dan treaty that if we were asked to uphold it in Islam, we would do it because, and he would not give up his place for uh, 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 for a place of ro uh, red camels. They had all, um, everyone had agreed that uh, they, the rights of those, they had all agreed would be given those rights. So anyone who had uh, uh, had their rights taken away from them, the, commu the, the pact meant that folks were going to be committed to returning their rights to them, and no oppressor would have the hand uh, over the oppressed. So the Prophet this, this is actually very indicative. This is before revelation. The Prophet was actively involved in his community. And he was somebody who was active in his society. And people had also seen him as a man of, as a young man of stature for being involved in this as well. Um, oppression, child abuse, racism, and poverty impacts us all. And the Prophet was actually in, in, involved in working on these issues prior to his prophecy. And we wanted to uh, in, like, kind of show this through line that the Prophet and then uh, the Islam that he had preached was kind of imbued with you know, helping the oppressed and watching out, uh, like holding back the oppressor. And we'll actually jump in a bit about some of the uh, principles of prophetic organizing. Uh, so this is work that you know, our organization, MASS, Iman, MSA West, have really kind of uh, sought to distill and understand that you know there are elements of the prophetic tradition that really overlap with our community organizing principles. So this first principle is that the Prophet ﷺ was hyper relational. He knew everybody that was coming in to the community. He knew non-Muslims that were in the community. And this was something that he had been very um, uh, keen on. You know, we had we know traditions that you know Omar ibn Khattab had, you know, was actually against the Prophet And when he came to meet the Prophet he had accepted his Islam. So meaning that the Prophet was knew uh, had engaged with individuals on every level. There's one story that I wanted to um, relate. Uh, this was between this was during the Battle of the Trench. The Prophet was approached by a man from one of the tribes outside of Medina and who had accepted Islam. And he had, uh, the Prophet uh, uh, his name was Nu'aym ibn Masood. He said, he asked the Prophet should I make my Islam public? The Prophet said, actually, no, keep it, uh, keep it like quiet because he was connected to some of the Jewish tribes that were outside of Medina that were, or that were planning to lay siege within Medina. The Prophet advised him, see what you can to sow discord amongst them. And so Noam actually informed the Quraysha that the Quraysh, that he basically had, you know, sowed misinformation between the two opposing tribes that were against the Muslims to uh, confuse them from actually laying siege and invading into the city of Medina. Um, this, uh, he informed the Quraysha around this and the Quraysha would suffer. And so the Prophet ﷺ basically had, you know, understood the power of relationship, saying that, you know, here's an individual who had accepted Islam who wanted to do something for the community, but... The Prophet ﷺ said that, hey, be tactical and be thoughtful of how you're going to le leverage your opportunity. You have a relationship with two tribes that are against us. How is it that you can, you know, like uh, help towards the situation of preventing the Quraysh from laying siege and invading into Medina? And so, uh, specifically around this, the uh, Noaim had actually t advised the two tribes that the Quraysh would not invade unless you are supporting them, and they have doubts around it. And he had s sowed misinformation around this. And ultimately, the two tribes did not actually invade uh, and make a move against the Prophet ﷺ. And some commentators will say that it was, uh, Noam was responsible for doing so. And so I just wanted to illustrate again this, this aspect that the Prophet ﷺ had thought very strategically with the relationships that he had. Um, the next piece is that he had taken counsel or shura with his companions. Uh, we know that the Prophet وسلم, uh, from as it related to worship, he did not, uh, like his he had received revelation from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and it was very clear. But as it related to worldly matters, he consulted often with his companions, and so one of these incidents that we try to illustrate uh, from an organizing perspective, particularly around campaigns, was around uh, the Battle of Uhud. 
So the Prophet Sallallahu older companions actually advised against going out uh, for uh, battle. But it was the younger companions who had missed Badr and had um, energy to, uh, for a confrontation that advised the Prophet Sallallahu to do so. Um, he, while the Prophet Sallallahu himself uh, had, there's indication that he had said that initially it was not his intention to go out so, he had done it. And the reason that this is a, such a great organizing principle is that we as organizers, we are going to take advice from the leaders that we have around us and that we're going to engage on a campaign around it. And we mentioned that a campaign is something that's within a specific time bound. So in the incident of Uhud, the Muslims, subhanAllah, subhanallah, they had taken a loss. But the Prophet ﷺ had followed through on this campaign and there was lessons learned from it. And then we have revelation that also teaches us from the moment of Uhud. So council is also another key component of, uh, within our organizing principles that sees a strong overlap. The next uh, piece is being a patient through strategic action. Um, so, you know, we want to keep in uh, mind the long-term goal uh, in space of like a short-term compromise. Um, do folks have any, uh, can, can they pull on something from the CEDAW where the Prophet ﷺ had, you know, made a commitment towards a long-term goal that was a short-term compromise? What had actually happened, Auntie, if you would like to share on that? So, um, Prophet and his companions were going towards Makkah and they were stopped. And at that time, um, Muslims who were with him, they were kind of angry that why we are stopped and we should keep going. And Prophet actually listened to his wife. His wife gave advice that, uh, am I missing? That's, yeah. No, Prophet agreed with them. The people from Quraysh came and they said that you can come next year, but not this year. Right. And Prophet ﷺ, due to his wisdom or maybe Allah's help, agreed with them. But people were angry who were with him that why we are on the right That's path, amazing. why we do that. And then his wife said that you go out and you do your um, head Hello. shaving yep. and all that. Absolutely. So people will follow because initially they were not following. Yeah. And um, so um, what was the point I'm telling? So um, like this story of being strategic, like. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So there was. And then when they were returning, uh, uh, Allah gave this revelation to uh, the prophet that you are actually, you have a big victory. Big, uh, Absolutely. Initially it, it was like a defeat, but actually it was a big victory because it won so many people's heart. And then they, he prevented a big conflict and from that. And, Absolutely. and a year after they were victorious. Right. And that, and that led to the Fatha Makkah. Fatha Makkah, yeah, so a year after. Absolutely. So that was the wisdom behind like long-term goal yep. and then uh, compromising on short-term. Yeah. That was a wonderful example for and yeah. this is also another key example for us. for us is yep absolutely as communities as commu uh, community organizers as well and this idea that you know uh, just spelling like clarifying that so the, the treaty of Hudaybiya was that the prophets are they they were planning on making pilgrimage they were stopped and then they had to write a treaty that would prevent them from continuing this year and going on with the uh, the following year his closest companions were very uh, disagreed with this decision and there was in Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And leading by example. Absolutely. And that's actually the, the example that I had for this point of led by example was specifically that. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Rashi. Also, there was another situation where, um, where uh, the, any, any Muslims that went from Mecca to Medina would have to be returned to Mecca. And what, what that ended up happening was that, like, the Muslims in Mecca, like, went to the outskirts and like uh, caused like division 
and um, caused trouble for the Meccans. And so that ultimately like backfired, even though it seemed like it was a victory for the yeah. Meccans at that time. Yeah, exactly. Like that. And it, to us, like though these points are that you know this happens very much in our community organizing work. We may have leadership that we don't agree with their immediate decisions, but we don't like if we are within a community and we share values and there's been a, like a structure that's been established, trusting your leadership to that extent and then evaluating, okay, in this context, as organizers, we can say that this campaign was a 10-year campaign. The peace was for 10 years. And it had yielded unseen benefits because the, the treaty was broken prior to that. And this, ex this notion of leading by example, I oftentimes get emotional sharing this, subhanAllah, because the Prophet his companions were hesitant to complete the pilgrimage. And his wife, Omar Radhiallahu's daughter, had suggested, go, out the, go outside of your tent and shave your head, and then the companions will respond to you. And the Prophet subhanAllah, he had done it, and his companions were, had, you know, were the, the narration say that, you know, the, they had, you know, was as if they had just woken up, and they were like, oh, you know, the Prophet is doing this, we should, have been, we should have been the first to do this, and not like have this hesitation or doubt around him. Also, within this, uh, within this Hudaybiyah incident, there's also this notion that the Prophet was deeply disrespected by the Quraysh, right? You know, when he was uh, asked to sign the agreement, you know, he was told to strike his name as Muhammad Sallallahu the Messenger of Allah, right? Muhammad. No, no problem. No, I should, I should be more mindful. No, no problem, no problem. Alhamdulillah. Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And this actually deeply offended the, his community and the leaders around him. And so we have to reckon, these are lessons for us as organizers, as leaders within the community that, you know, obviously we have some sort of ghayra, some sort of like anger that, you know, our leader is being disrespected, but we also understand that if our leader is making a decision that we will, to the extent that it makes sense, we will like, you know, follow through with it. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, when it comes to, you know, that, that man was very, very different because uh, that was, he was the prophet, peace be upon him, and he knew mm. he had the wisdom from God and that, that, that the revelation came to him. In this community that we are in, we can't really rely on the group of people at the, mm. uh, it might be massages or group of leaders. We cannot just really count on them to say what, stay away, don't do any activism, don't do yeah. any of that because we believe on their rationale or their right. I don't think that's the case. In today's age, a time, I think it has changed. Mm -hmm. I don't think, yes, if it was profit, peace be upon them, yes. But if they make a decision that all the people in the community should not be activists, they should not be doing anything for the community mm -hmm. at large, I think that's the wrong approach. I don't, I don't agree with that. Sure. I don't know where, maybe um, uh, Brother Salah could tell us about it, and where could we draw from and say that, you know, how can we change the, the minds of the people, the community leaders or the massages are being in different areas, how can we move them so that they can see that what they're doing is wrong? We are, yeah. They're not actually doing activism. Yeah, I appreciate sharing that. And there's like a little bit of like tension in how we describe that. I, for my purposes, when we talk about organizing, we're talking about like within a base where there is like a hyper relational culture where that the leader is constantly receiving feedback. I, I can, without getting into like some broader examples that I think are in the conversations now like the idea is that if you are within an organization or an entity where it's like very clear that you're engaging in a certain campaign or a certain action how is it that you'd still like you know may express that you know this does not fall tactically with my value like my, my issues there but i still want to be engaged around it sorry that's our oh no uh so i think uh the, actually i just lost my train of thought so the idea being that within like an uh, organizing kind of within a power organization, and this is what we'll refer to as community organizing groups, within a power organization, if there's been a set like campaign or a goal that's been set, we oftentimes say that, you know, the organizers, if say if I'm leading a campaign for Empower Change that's going to run for the gamut of six months, uh, and we've arrived to a decision-making process that I will, like, we are going to execute on this. In the meantime, we, I have some staffers that may think that, Ishraq, this doesn't make sense. But we want to say that, oh, we are only going to try this campaign for this X amount of time. And after that, we can evaluate. I think that's where the tension is for us. Like, you know, the reality is that the community is not uh, as black and white or a textbook that, you know, we're going to follow a campaign A through Z. But how do we kind of uh, like insert kind of like uh, an element where there, there is a lot of feedback and understanding. And at the end of the day, like, what, like certain, certain pieces 
have to be, um, for the campaign to move forward, would make sense to continue on. And then there's other channels of how you can push back. Um, I didn't, I'm realizing I'm opening up a can of worms around it, but um, I'll take like two comments on it. Sorry. I was just going to say that I think the point of the story, or what I got out of it, was not blindly trust leadership and, and don't ask questions. It was the concept of long-term victory versus short-term gain. So it's not like, oh, leadership is telling us to do X, and they're not giving us a rationale, they're not giving us a reason, it's illogical, and we should just follow that illogical line of reasoning. No, the point here is there was logic in it. It seemed like a loss in the short term, but there was a rational argument for why in the long term it was worth, the cost benefit was worth it. So what I got out of the story was cost benefit sometimes isn't clear because you see a short term loss, you see your ego being hurt, but when you're doing that cost benefit analysis, think bigger. That's what I got out of it. of um, leadership here, we are not talking of our masajids uh, imam, so if the sister is referring mm -hmm. to them, so yeah. if they say don't get engaged, it's a different uh, yeah. mindset. Yeah. This is saying that you know, think about it, but yeah. they don't have the wisdom that the prophet had, and what they're doing is not right, and I, I don't believe in, uh, in making all the masajids, and I don't want to go to the political point of it, that's their issue. To make the massage saying that you're not going to be, we are political. I'm sorry, you wear a hijab, you're out there, you have a beard, you're Muslim, you're political. I, I don't care what you say, you are political, and that's the community we are in. You have to be involved. You have to move the issues. You have to be in the community. You can't just be isolated and put yourself in the bubble and say, look, I'm a Muslim and I'm doing good for myself. No, stop. You got to move out in the community because you're engaged in this community. Right? Yeah. And, and I don't think we can look at the prophet and say, yeah, the prophet had his own wisdom and the God given the wisdom. But the fact that the leaders, now they say that they are having, they have the power and they are, have the wisdom. I don't agree with their wisdom because they're out of touch with reality. They don't understand the reality of what's going on in the community at large. I think there's like a, and we will discuss it briefly. Maybe we can actually make that pivot right now. In community organizing sense, what is a leader? Do folks have a sense? Uh, anyone that's able to gather others around them to follow what they want. Yeah. Someone that for, is good at doing that and has that ability for some purpose. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so if you have a leader that people don't follow, believe what they're saying and don't, then maybe they're not that great of a leader. <laughs> yeah. And, and I should, oh, go right ahead. I think a leader is someone who inspires people. Um, to want to do something as opposed to making their agenda someone else's priority, like inspiring people to want the same things so that they actually want to do them as opposed to like asking or even like forcibly asking them to do so. So I think of being a leader as like an act of service um, where you have to listen to your constituents, gather feedback, and the benefit of having a leader is that they're, they're a good decision maker. Like, once there's a consensus, they can act on it. To add to all uh, what she was just said, I, uh, I look at the leader as somebody who's able and capable to institute even minute change mm. in the right direction. Because that takes uh, vision, somebody with a vision uh, that can actually make that vision a reality. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, groundbreaking, even right. the minute small steps. Eventually, if you are capable of doing so, you will be regarded by everybody else as a leader. Yeah. So that kind of leads to this point. Does a le is a leader someone that necessarily holds like an official title or a role or like some office? Right. Yeah, absolutely, a change maker. As organizers, my first, uh, when I first got in as a professional organizer in Chicago, my director gave me a list of 20 names and was like, Ishraq, you're gonna call every single one of these individuals, set up meetings with them, and start to get to know who the community leaders are. And she's like, don't be fo like fooled by a title of like, you know, this person is like the social justice chair at St. Thomas Catholic Church in Naperville, Illinois. 
like find out who are the who are the folks that they work with in the community that are the people that are moving individuals. And so for us, we're trained early on to say that a leader is someone that will, you know, do a minute change, do something that, you know, that their hold their values are informing a vision that they have, and they're able to move people around them, uh, around them on it. Part of our challenge is like, you know, are we trained to expect that, you know, of course, you know, people that are in elected positions or invisible roles are leaders in a certain capacity as well. But I know very well in Long Island, if I need to make a, like, get some, some activities happening in my masjid, the president and the imam are one thing. I have to find out which uncle in the community is going to say that, hey, he, like, he may have a gathering for a barbecue in the middle of the summer on, like, after 4th of July. That's the uncle that I know I can talk to saying that, hey, I need you to register everyone that's at your house for the like, voter registration and then bring that, do that something visibly at the mosque so that other people will uh, take it on. Um, and so for us, there's this notion that, you know, always identify individuals that are doing, that are driven by their values and have a certain vision of what they're trying to do. Or if you're understanding that there's an individual that has the ability to move people, understand what their values are. And if you as an organizer have a vision that, you know, this, ha this is something, the direction that we should go in, see if that leader understands where you're coming from. And then see if they're able to motivate and mobilize people around them. They're change makers. bring that effect and uh, kind of drive that change. It, the change shouldn't just stay with you. If you really want to see it coming in action, then it has to have an effect and it should be moving forward. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. So um, one of the other concepts that I, uh, going back to like some of these prophetic organizing principles that translate now is being open to unconventional tactics. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I'll move this along. It's that, you know, in the, uh, the battle, uh, the Ahzab battle and the battle of the trench, uh, the Prophet had actually consulted with Salman ibn Farsi who said that, oh, let's just actually dig a trench, which is unusual for the Hijaz, for the Korea, for people in the, uh, the Arabian uh, uh, Gulf to uh, understand. And the Prophet had adopted an unconventional tactic in his organizing. And again, I'm treating that, you know, this campaign was an organizing campaign because we as organizers, especially the Muslim organizers, see these as like real, like true lessons that the Prophet ﷺ was open to trying something that was different, quote unquote, out of left field, not tried before, but came through like a trusted source. And we want to think through with our organizing as well that, you know, it may be, um, and I'm trying to think of like a pretty, we, so for us, it's always, when we do our civic engagement work at Empower or whatever work I've done in the past in New York, we want to be able to get um, people making phone calls to Muslims. One of the tactics that we discovered is that, oh, ask every single kid at youth group to get their cell phone from their older brother or their older sister because their parents are not going to give them cell phones. And this is like 2012, 2011-ish. So they got their cell phones. We just sat them down. Quote, it's not in the spectrum of things being very radical or different. It wasn't that unusual. But it was unheard of that we had like seven or eight-year-olds making phone calls, reminding people to vote. And uh, I had them be on speaker so I could hear some of these conversations. And people were saying that, oh, you sound like you're very young. Like, why, why are you doing this? And so I, I can't remember the little boy's name. But he was saying that, you know, I think voting is very important. And my community, my parents are going to vote. So I think you should, too. And so it was just really interesting to hear just kind of, it was unconventional. The person on the phone was not expecting like an eight-year-old uh, on the other end of the line. But we were, I just was thinking that, OK, the college-age kids that committed to doing phone banking did not show up. I had a youth group that was there, and I anticipated that, hey, like, y'all are going to be there for youth group the hour that you're done. Make sure you get your cell phones from your siblings, and then they were able to do that. So it's just kind of thinking in our organizing realm, like, just nothing has to be, like, cookie cutter. To, I mean, uh, you can just be open to thinking of different ways of making, a uh, going towards your goals. And next, we'll actually jump into relational uh, meetings. And so this is the whole idea of being relational is built on the foundation of doing one-to-ones. We want to like ha get to know the people in our community and understand what their self-interest is. Uh, we mentioned again, what was self-interest? Or what was the spectrum that it lied in between? Between selfishness and selflessness. So I myself may have an interest, and I'll give a concrete example. When I moved to Los Angeles five years ago, I came from New York, so I was like, I don't really need to bring my car. I'm going to come to LA and just rely on public transit, survive that until Sarah moved in with me. But um, the idea was that, you know, I can get by on public transit 
and around uh, my bicycle. So I use that as like my individual self-interest for, you know, uh, of why I should be an advocate for public transit. And then I ended up joining an organization before I worked at Empower Change called the LA County Bicycle Coalition. And their whole rhetoric was very different. They're like, you know, on paper, we're a bicycle advocacy organization. But in reality, we recognize that public transit is not available in low-income communities or communities of color. So we are recognizing that the city is diverting a lot of funding towards different initiatives. But if we want to see, like, you know, education and economic resources happening in, like, South LA or East LA, how are we making sure that we're advocating for individuals that are, you know, that need public transit to get to downtown to go to work or to go to LA City College or get to USC or UCLA? So there was this idea that, you know, my self-interest was that I'm a big believer in public transit. My selfishness was that, you know, there's a larger systemic problem around, like, inequality around public transit. And that I, we were at an organization that balanced that, the two, that a lot of individuals on that staff were people of color that had, that had been educated but came from working class backgrounds. And that's how we had described the tension that we had, or the dynamic that we had in the coalition, because people had oftentimes asked our executive director, even asked me, they're like, Ishraq, it looks like you did a lot of labor organizing in New York. Why are you in a bicycle transit uh, organization? And I, had, I was able to describe that, you know, my self-interest is around this, and we see this larger systemic challenge. So, Jumping a bit into uh, the one-to-one, -one, we want to be able to under, uncover when we talk to an individual what their self-interest is, perhaps around a specific issue if that's the context, or more so just really get folks to uh, like articulate the values that they live by. Because if you understand the values that they live by and, the, and they understand the values that you have, then you'll be able to share that, oh, you know what, like we both care about homelessness. We both had a moment where like I had some friends that I actually had a friend uh, that I had not seen in about 10 years when I moved to Los Angeles, walking out of the masjid, and he was homeless. And he told me, Ishraq, uh, he recognized me first. And he's like, do you remember who I am? And I'm like, it took me a second. He's like, don't you remember me from Boston? And I'm like, oh my God, I do remember you. And he's like, hey, don't tell uh, the other individuals that I'm going through this kind of rough patch right now, but I've been homeless in LA for like about a year. And so I was like, it surprised me but then I recognized that, oh, we had a shared value, that we had like this Muslim brotherhood that we had in Boston, and that here we are, and then we were like, myself and a few other individuals, we looked to, you know, identif like, identify resources for him. But the idea is that we, were, like, in that moment, as like the context was a little uh, uh, unusual, we were still able to connect and understand that, hey, we shared, like, we, like, I was able to understand where he was, what was going on, and how we could support one another. And so, um, with that relational meeting, we just want to folks to like again speak to uh, to uncover an individual's values, and then what are some issues that they may be of interest for them. Um, so when we do a one-to-one, -one, we re realize that you know this is a very intentional conversation that we want to have with an individual. So it's like saying that hey, I want to kind of grab coffee or lunch with you for about an hour on Tuesday afternoon just to talk about you know some of the things that you care about, or and I want you to hear about some of the things that I'm working on. So like if it's on working on the Bernie campaign, you can be very transparent and say that, hey, I'm working on this campaign, was wondering, like wanted to learn more about like what you're doing if this campaign is of interest to you, but just kind of really recognize and know like what values you have around the election or what, what issues are motivating you towards it. Um, the other piece that as an organizer you want to identify is why does an individual care? And this is around, again, their self-interest and their values. Are they somebody that's directly like affected by a specific issue, or are they impacted? So in that situation uh, of relating to my friend that I had met in, uh, in Koreatown in Los Angeles, I wasn't directly affected by being homeless, but I was deeply impacted that he was somebody that, you know, we would have dinner together, he would crash at my, like we were close, and he was somebody that was, that was somebody close to me that was deeply impacted, and I, or I, sorry, I was deeply impacted by it, and that's what motivated me to wanting to do support or doing that work. And we say that as organizers kind of try to uncover what is like the kind of emotion or the engine for why people do what they do. And chances are it may be because they're directly impacted or they're deeply uh, directly affected or deeply impacted by somebody that they're close to. And then uh, this question again, what values drive their decisions? Have folks heard of like relational meetings and doing one-to-ones before? Cool. So then we're, Oh, I'm looking, pulling the wrong slides. 
So now I just kind of want folks to uh, just turn to the person next to you and find, we already spoke about this, like why folks are here today, but speak a bit more deeply and try to uncover like, you know, what's a value that drives them to care about the community? And also like, you know, what's an issue that they do care about and what's the kind of value that they, um, that informs that decision? Um, so if we could just take five minutes to do that. Yeah. So I'm if everyone can hear me clap once. If everyone can hear me clap twice. Cool. Um, cool. So I think we went a little bit over five minutes, but one, I realized that folks were having conversation. Five minutes is really not like the, uh, the it's too short of a time to get to know one another. Um, I just love to get, again, this is my opportunity to get to know how what folks are thinking, what folks are feeling. So I'd love to just kind of hear um, what folks have heard from their partners that they've been speaking to in terms of what brought them here, some of the values that they have. Maybe we'll start. Oh, oh, we can do popcorn. Okay, cool. So I I shared that um, you know I have, have I, I love to I mean I have this dream and wish that oh I want to impact the community I want to make a difference how can I make an impact but I don't really know how mm. so I'm hoping that coming here I'll be able to learn one or two techniques one or two tips that. Is that are practical that I can actually take with me. And Brother Abdullah, just sitting beside me, he shared some really practical tips with some of the things he does in his own neighborhood. Mm. So with his neighbors and so on. I mean, things I can run with. That that's very useful. Cool. I appreciate you. Sure. Um, so like Brother Musa said, yeah, we we shared, um, you know, some. You know, similar ideas. One of one of our one of my goals is when we moved down here was to actually be able to, you know, kind of um, have a sense of uh, you know awareness of the community, uh, of course amongst the you know amongst the Muslim communities, but also being able to kind of um, you know have a good relationship with my neighbors, and 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 because of the fact that the the um, the, in the media uh, for the last eighteen years has been so negative towards the uh, you know what we all know about the you know the stories that that's happening as far as you know the negative press about <clears throat> about Islam and Islamophobia in general so uh, my wife and I our, our main goal has been to um, at least take the small steps and that is to actually you know be you know lead by example and 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 kind of you know teach the small steps that we can about Islam and, and what we know and how how you know, you know, not, 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 you know, you know, you have to be very, you know, uh, lead, like I said, lead by example, and also just be able to, you know, let them know that the fact that, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're good people, we we have a good faith, our faith is, it's nothing about, it's, it's all about peace. So, you know, the small steps that, 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 and, and that we have taken it, and has gone a long ways now. And, mm -hmm. and quite honestly, our, our entire neighborhood knows us and, and, and most of them are Americans, and they really, you know, um, they have a different view of Islam now. I would say when we moved sure. in about ten years ago. Got so, um, and hopefully with today, uh, you know, we can learn some more. Thank right, you. Well, thank you. Uh, let's uh, uh, leave comments about like forty-five seconds to a minute per individual, so that way we can just get a quick like kind of feel for them. Um, so we am is very passionate about um, tackling othering people. Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the reasons is because she just was in a program where there was a lot of international students and there were also like white students and they just kind of sub-segregated and the international felt students um, just felt very like, you know, disconnected and like they felt like uh, uh, they didn't belong and that really impacted her because she had a lot of international student friends. Um, and uh, it's it's not a nice place to be, and so that is something that she wants to tackle. Got it. Thank you. Um, and Rashid was inspired by um, a talk that we went to at Berkeley. Robert Reich, um, who's a mm. like professor, but I I never attended his lectures until we went to like this extra event. Um, anyways, he was talking about um, how sometimes leadership. Um, serves to undercut the people at the bottom and it was very powerful 
Tarasha to see thousands of people gathered um, and like fired up about these issues coming from like such a um, person who used to have high authority and like he's from the inside so he knows um, what happened and like how, how, the, how the system is not really set up for the people at the bottom. And he hopes to empower people through the next um, presidential campaign to like be involved and I guess he's just like looking for better ways to connect with people and um, make sure that like our values are what drives us in this next period of our lives. I can just, uh, I think, um, sorry, was it Zarina? Yeah, um, one thing that I think you brought up that I felt was a good point was um, just the necessity of us as Muslims also working on broader issues and in order to represent ourselves in like the greater movement rather than simply advocating for us or even just, you know, advocating for Islam. Um, simply because we are, you know, we're a minority and it's not, it's not going to be the default that people are going to care about us or care about what our struggles are. We have to we have to both advocate for ourselves as Muslims, but we also have to um, just engage and advocate for causes and work for causes um, that may, that affect all of us, so that we like we push this kind of vision that we are part of this community and we work on everything that affects our communities. Yeah, so uh, Wahab was concerned about uh, Islamophobia. Uh, maybe he didn't put the, the term, and so he's concerned about how Muslims are looked up and perceived of, and he wants to be more involved, but uh, did not know how quiet, and hopefully mm -hmm. he'll get something out of it and have to be involved and do more to be, that Muslims are good people in general, and they do good things. So um, we have to be involved, I think. I mean, at the end of the day, the homelessness doesn't affect me personally, but I see people in my community affected. And here in Muslims in DC, they spend a lot of money, hundreds of people on the list of zakat money funds. But we on as a community are just sitting and waiting to see something happens for the homeless. So if I don't do it, who else is going to do it? Um, so, um, uh, Part of the reason why I'm here is because um, I'm trying to learn. Um, you know, there there are some some competencies, I guess you could say, that uh, that I have from being a leader in my place of work, and I think they're similar to uh, the what we're what we're learning here. But I want to perfect that to become a better leader, and um, and I knew that by me coming to something like this, I would meet uh, folks like um, Salah. Who has uh, a plethora of, of knowledge uh, about the the religion and how to how to sort of apply um, uh, some of the fundamental aspects of the religion through um, through social justice and advocacy and whatnot. So um, you know, just uh, I guess taking more of a solemn approach of, but just honored to be here and to and to learn um, as much as possible. But some of the things that uh, hit kind of close to home with me right now is uh, homelessness. I wish to create homefulness. I've, I've been in the Bay Area my whole life, and I've, and I've seen the gentrification. I've seen a lot, of, a lot of folks end up on the streets, including my friends, uh, some family members. And you know, I'm, I'm working right now with a group that's created safe car parks to, uh, to sort of affect change in that um, aspect. And, um, and also just... Um, just really trying to move members of my community as African American, uh, Muslim, uh, you know, coming from an oppressed people, uh, marginalized part of the community. I, I, I see the nest, the need for people like myself to stand up and help uh, lead folks in the right direction. And, um, yeah. One. Um <laughs> um, one common value that we kind of discovered amongst the three of us was that we really wanted to see um, people from our community getting more involved within the 
to influence the American society uh, on different levels. So whether it's in decision making or with uh, among the young people in the community, the children as they're growing up um, through different means, some, some through uh, creating opportunities to learn the language or um, for some of us influencing people in power and taking some of those roles that can influence policymakers. Um, and so that was kind of what brought us here and what we hope to do in our different initiatives that we have going on. Yeah, so the sense of community um, is what has brought us here. And that's what we were discussing, utilizing our skills and capabilities, what we are good at, to uh, and apply it for the, you know, the better cause of serving the community, not just your individual selves or your own children or at, at home. And that has brought, uh, especially I'll give an example. Um, I have been teaching my kids to learn Arabic uh, because that's a connecting language between different um, you know, people and coming from the same faith. And uh, understanding your own religion, it's really helpful. And that was lacking in the local community colleges and uh, high schools here. So um, what we did is we did a survey, how many people would like to have Arabic as a you know, language taught in community colleges. Mm. And uh, so that was really taken up by its, you know, with its uh, uh, you know, full, full vigor. And we were able to start the Arabic language in Diablo Valley College, San Ramon campus. So that was an effort, really. I'm so mm. hap happy for that. And our next step is uh, to bring uh, more languages from Middle East and from Asian you know, Asia to community colleges. So Urdu and Farsi are going to be on the list. Um, and sure. I'm already in, uh, in communication with the dean of San Ramon campus, DPC. So let's hope for the best, because I believe languages not only bring people together, but cultures together and understand each other. And that's what the goal is about, to bring mm. peace and harmony in the community. Got it, Jessica. Yeah, so I think we discussed, and mine is also more for the low-income uh, society people, and then helping them to also become more I believe uh, me the reason for me being here uh, is uh, understanding relationality for uh, really relationality being my driving force here my driving thing to point to take home and to kind of be my foundation to keep building on the blocks that will bring the bigger change because until I understand relationality, until I understand the values of the other people in my community, we won't be able to understand the common goal and uh, the common interest. And I believe on the bigger spectrum, the common interest is bringing peace. And if you are able to explain to everybody that we are here to bring peace and harmony between all, uh, all different cultures, societies, uh, relationality is very important and I believe Brother Chima's point was community organizing and community organization on organizing and relationality go hand in hand you have to understand people and then kind of organize them and take them together uh, finding uh, maybe making self their community self-interest your interest yeah. as a, as a leader maybe that's but Sahadeen, I know we had skipped over you but I would love to Fifteen seconds. Uh, I think what drives me is uh, is what I think ought to be driving any Muslim who aspires to become a mu'min, which is to be activated to uphold uh, social justice that's based on economic justice and environmental justice. Uh, so that's my bigger encompassing uh, values that I work tirelessly the last quarter century uh, in all these three fields. And number two, uh, the necessity and the need for us to be civically engaged and politically active. Um, and I'll do anything in my hands to start it here in the Bay Area and uh, I intend to continue doing that. Thanks. Thank you.
So I appreciate, and I was just taking notes, just kind of understanding like where folks' values and like kind of issue areas lie. Um, so like Sabine, I know you mentioned you want to understand the relationality here. I think I heard in the room that there is uh, a strong concern or that folks want the, like us to control, like the Muslim community to be able to be known to the broader non-Muslim community. And I think Brother Abdullah, Abdullah had mentioned that him and his wife, you know, had gone out in the community. They make themselves known to the neighbors and sister. Yeah. Hmm. The genesis. Mm. Yeah. Right. Right. Sure. I mean, I think what I'm hearing is that, you know, folks want to be able to control, like, you know, uh, how do we demonstrate that our, we're living out our Muslim values authentically? And it comes around specific issues. So for like Sisters Amina, like you were mentioning that homelessness is something that you're feeling very strongly about. Brandon, you also mentioned that, you know, homelessness is something that, homefulness is something, the vision that you have of bringing people towards. In Serbia, though, you mentioned that, you know, having like a medical and dental clinic. So these are, if our, our values inform the kind of work that we do, of course, it's like almost second nature that people will be like, oh, the Muslims are the ones that are doing this. So you're not, like, you may be, you don't necessarily have to lead by your identity alone. It is the work that you're doing that will speak volumes to the, uh, how you are represented within the community. And of course, you know, that's, that may be also like in a vacuum kind of statement. We do understand that, you know, there is other media angles at play that, you know, that portray Muslims in a negative light. But I think one of the key things that I've been recognizing is that when people say that they're interested in doing something that's service oriented, it may not be like a glittery like political campaign, but it's like something that's like bringing improvement and good to their local community. And if Muslims are the ones that are visibly leading that, the only thing that you have to do to kind of like add the right spin to it is like, you know, making sure that you're like finessing like the media contacts around it about the work that you're doing. Um, and that's something that we're learning at Empower as well, that, you know, as f as long we're uncovering that, you know, many people are motivated and activated to do work on the issues that they care about. How do we ensure that, you know, there we're putting like a Muslim narrative around that work? Um, and Sabine, so, I'm looking to you as a board member here too, that there, it sounds like there's an opportunity here to engage in many ways, even with like this idea of like, you know, bringing lang language is like the key way of bring bridging communities together, right? If that's like, a value and like what animates and motivates you, that's something that can be always told as it creating an inclusive space too. And so it's just kind of recognizing like, you know, um, and I think somebody, you had mentioned that, you know, how do we balance and quote unquote, like prioritize with our self interest as a community? One, it's literally putting it all on the table, saying that, hey, I'm an individual that has interest in this. I'm an individual who has an interest in YZ and all that. And then just kind of like, and that requires a level of like, you know, uh, familiarity and then sharing, being like not shy to share that like, hey, I mean, I'll use myself as a punching bag example. I love biking. So like I usually lead in spaces that like, or with groups around me that, hey, I'm always about doing outdoorsy work. Like if there's something that we can do to bring youth from the youth group at the mosque or whatever group to bike around Los Angeles and do like a city tour, let's do it. So like the just folks may know, like if you are in a community and you're being relational, you want to understand what are the different pieces that uh, make up the community. And then you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, we are, so time-wise, we're going to take a break in about 15 minutes. Um, and I think we're, we're 
probably, so in 15 minutes, we'll take a break. Then we'll have Doha at 1.30. Then after we get back from Doha, we'll eat. And then we'll kind of uh, look to wrap up some of the concepts around power here. I'm going to, I'm actually not going to jump into power right now. But I wanted to kind of dig in about this, uh, this conversation about uh, being relational. I'll share one slide and then kind of dig back into some of the things that I think we can apply and do different when we have relational conversations. But um, let's go with this. And I just wanted to, again, reaffirm the idea of relationships being at the center of our tradition. And because we have a few bullet points, I would love for just folks to maybe go down a line, just read one bullet point, the next person reads the next bullet point out loud. Let's start with you, Sabine. The way of Allah. Then again, Umar said, make a wish. Another man said, I wish that this house was full of precious jewels and pearls so that I could spend it all in charity for the sake of Allah. Again, Omar asked for the third time, make a wish. His companions said, we don't know what to say, O leader of the believers. At that point, Umar said, I wish that this house was full of people like Abu Abad bin Jarrah, um, Muadin bin Jabal, and Salim, so that they can help me spread the word of Allah. So this I wanted to key in on. I think I run into communities saying that, hey, like we can fundraise, we can do this. Say in uh, New York, we can like um, piece of it is like, you know, we can mobilize individuals. But the key thing here, Omar bin Khattab just really recognized that it's when you have people bringing in their, their full selves and they're in community, this is where we can make change. And for Omar, his message is very clear. It's help me spread the word of Allah. And like, you know, we all talked about making sure that Islam is known uh, within the community. Um, our idea, like the thing that I wanted to drive home here is like as we like want to get dig in, get to know one another, and we like kind of form community or we're reforming community, we really get to understand each other as individuals and understand what our strengths, what our interests are. Um, and then I typically look to like the official leadership of a community saying that, hey, you should like have a strong sense that, you know, these individuals are down to do service by providing medical service. Someone else can you know, provide mentoring for youth. Someone else is actually tacking, tackling homelessness. So you're actually making like a quote unquote like power analysis of the resources and strengths that you have in the community. And these are the individuals that you know, help you kind of understand that your community organizing base may not all be about repeal the ban or modern state voting. Because not everyone in the community is registered to vote or a citizen that is eligible to vote. But like understanding what kind of moves and works for people uh, is a key thing as an organizer, as a leader of any advocacy or a power organization um, to build kind of the work that they want to do. So do folks have other thoughts on this or reflections? Cool. So I know um, I'm going to jump back to this slide on relational meetings. I heard a lot of uh, folks saying that, you know, they're like uh, speaking broadly in the sense that you know we want to make sure that Islam is represented properly in community. We we don't know how to necessarily get involved. Some folks had opened up and said that you know they want to be working on homelessness or they're already active in doing work. And then uh, folks have mentioned that they want to be doing like kind of uh, medical and like provide services for the uh, the needy. One of the things that we realized with relational meetings is that it takes time to get somebody to open up and be vulnerable or authentic. And that requires like a level of trust. One of the, and I realize this, I should, um, we will share some like uh, addendum, like literature around this, but in order for an individual, we realize for somebody to be vulnerable and authentic to what they share, we want you as the organizer to also share something that's important to you. So part of it, I'm not trying, hopefully I'm not trying to feed my ego with like all the things that I'm sharing about myself, like biking, all this, that, the other, but it's just a sense that, you know, these are the things that animate and move me. 
And we realize that as organizers in individual conversations, this is what's going to let, allow that reciprocity to happen. That, you know, if folks may know that I like biking, then someone else may share that, oh, I actually, like, I'm a big car enthusiast, or whatever it may be, like, uh, around that. And we realize that when we're doing, when we want to have relational meetings with individuals, we say that it's an art of being able to share a bit about yourself and why you're motivated by certain values. And then ask, and then that also sets the stage. So I think I may be able to ask Salah Hadin, like, what brought you into this work? Like, for, like, being, like, understanding that Islam is, like, you know, is something that can activate individuals. I know, I may have shared that 9-11, the incident itself was not necessarily, like, that traumatic moment for me. But I was filled with so much anger and rage at 16, 17, seeing that, you know, the people in my community were saying that we have to maintain a low profile. We should do this, that, the other. I was reading Malcolm, and Malcolm was very proud of his identity and kind of recognizing that, you know, there were systemic oppressions that were happening to him. And he was able to connect it not only to black people in America, but to a broadly, like, a world movement of people that are oppressed. When I went into Boston, there were people in my community that were young men between 18 to 35 that were being pressured by the, uh, by the FBI. And one of my a good mentor of mine is now serving like a 25-year sentence on, some, on a charge. I won't necessarily get into the details of it, but these were the kind of moments that really fired me up, saying that our community is being labeled in certain ways. Our community is impacting people that have genuine and pious hearts that are being pushed and framed and like criminalized and politicized in all these ways. These were kind of the like motivating factors for me of why I wanted to do this work. Um, and then to me, and I would connect it to that vision piece or the values that I have, it's that, you know, I don't want individuals to be um, quote unquote, like uh, marginalized or be without power or have their story framed by somebody else. Therefore, I am in this work and I want folks to be a part of it with me. Um, I'm only sharing that is that, you know, typically if individual in my organizing work, folks will hear some version of that story around me. That, you know, I've had formational moments from my teen years that drive me to do this work several years later, like working odd hours, always traveling. We're like, people ask, like, what's like, you're mission driven in doing this work, you like, shouldn't you be doing something else? And I'm like, you know what, there's like certain pieces of my own personal experience that drive me to do this. And it coincides with my values as a person of faith, because I saw the prophet today said, um, do these, uh, transform people in that way. So all that being said, um, we, I will look to share some kind of more guidelines and relational meetings. And one of the things that we want to encourage folks is like the folks that are in this room, and we'll talk about this after lunch, like a, a kind of next step assignment will be that, you know, we want individuals to have one-to-one -one conversations with people that they're curious about in the community. Or they, they think they have a hunch that, you know, may share some values that you have, but don't necessarily know where to plug in around a specific issue. Or you even recognize that there is somebody that wants to plug into something, and you just want to know that out of a place of curiosity, do they want to, do they share the same vision that you may have around like an electoral campaign or doing like a, like a core service issue that's needed within the community? Um, and so that uh, to us, like we realize that the relational one-to-one -one meeting is not a one, per, like a one-time appointment, that it's a continuing relationship. Being relational means that there's ebbs and flows. There are certain times that folks can be very active and then other times they may not be able to for personal reasons, professional health whatever it may be. And we realize that this is the kind of mentality that we want to like uh, kind of inculcate and internalize within our community. That we recognize that, you know, Brother Salahuddin, it sounds like he's like a strong leader. In my mind, I could be like the transactional way. Tra I could be thinking transactionally that, you know, if I need to be in the Bay Area and I want to work with the group that's like ready to be like activated, I'm gonna come to MCC East Bay and the Yasin Foundation. And that's like a very transactional way for me to think. But then I, sh I want to kind of get down to that relational piece where Brother Salahuddin said that, you know what, like this weekend was not the right call for us to do Yassin found to do a training there. We should hold off until October, November when people are back. Kind of, you know, I start to kind of recognize what are the ebbs and flows of the kind of the challenges that he's facing. And we, I'm asking individuals that, you know, as you're kind of looking to organize or being leading within your community, Understand these dynamics of the individuals that you relate with. Um, going back to that story, and I'll stop here a little, little bit early before 1.15. Uh, my old director in uh, Chicago, Amy Lawless, she told me, Ishraq, like, I'm a little old school, and I think you should do this too. Every individual that you meet with, 
write, like start keeping like a log in a notebook. And I kept that practice since 2011. Usually every individual one-to-one -one that I have for my work at Empower, I keep like a log saying that, hey, I met with like Brother Salahuddin, for example, July 20th, 11 o'clock, got to find out who he is, just know his on paper biography, but also got a sense that, you know, I felt that he was really animated around this. And this is what I encourage a lot of leaders and community, community leaders and organizers, particularly younger folks, it's easier for me to tell them, like, this is the best practice. But to think through, um, you know, if you really want to be moving and moving people towards your vision and your cause, be very intentional and invest in the relationship. Know what kind of makes people tick, what are the things that they're not comfortable with, and, you know, act accordingly. Because you'll be, you'll internalize being a more thoughtful leader and that you will also like be sharing uh, more trust with that individual if you understand that you know they're not available to do this at this time or whatever it is. You're thoughtful around that. So I'll stop there. I'm here to answer to your reflections. Yeah. This is the people that we meet, right? But one problem is follow up. Mm. So you meet people. You, hey, you introduce yourself, and that's it. You don't. I mean, I'll give you an example. I'm going to put Sister Zarina on the spot. We used to be kind of work, doing some things together. I've not seen her for over a year. I didn't even call her. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I feel I feel ashamed to say that. So I mean, I don't even know if she was out of the country or something. Uh -huh. I, so just keeping a log, and I think that's a great discipline, right? But how do you kind of keep in touch with people or you just keep the log in case I need it in the future or just keep this record? Is that the idea behind that? I so <laughs> all the social media to keep keep up with folks. Mm. It kind of, you don't lose people that way. It doesn't yeah. take away years before you kind of reconnect. Yeah. Every year you have these chances of connecting over holidays or something. Keep that practice on. Yeah. Eid Mubarak, Happy New Year. Yeah. Yes. Being back on, on, on my own feet to doing things, to go back and reestablish myself, not not being part of MCC, being my, establishing who I am and what I want to work on. And to be successful at what I'm going to do, I have to make something for myself, right? Uh, so um, throughout the community doing the work, I realized that we have, uh, uh, the Muslim community has a huge amount of resources. They have the doctors and dentists. And I met with so many, I'm meeting, uh, I'm on the steering committee and housing committee and different organizations. And they're telling me that they need doctors in their community so that they can serve or work on the weekends. They, they need internal doctors to come and see the patients. These are the low-income families. And the dentists, who they have a clinic, they just opened a clinic, they're the Christians. So how do I, we get the Muslims to come and volunteer, showing up in there? Mm -hmm. You're doing a dawah right there. You know, yeah. It's my job now that the ball fell in my court that I have to find these doctors and tell them to go and volunteer in these places and be recognized by the community that Muslims are good people and they're doing work, mm -hmm. right? What a great thing to do. But it, this is the thing that I need to, I myself need to get back on, get involved more, do more in this here and show that who I am and what I've done is, was not in vain, you know? Yeah. So that, that's, that, that falls on me. Yeah. And to answer some of those things as well, like, like it's inherent in our culture to be relational, to like spread salam, to like give love to people during holidays. And Ramadan is just like this, like such a there's like untold barak on that but one of those things that we see as organizers is like oh man everyone's like kind of connected on this if you were had some sort of disagreement with someone like six months ago or during Ramadan if you've like been in community with them breaking fast or praying or whatever it may be though I've seen those relationships literally warm uh in my young age I've seen like in my little experience yeah yeah kind of send a box of Baklava or something, and they that really uh, builds that relation yeah. between them and us. That they know that we're here. This is something that we celebrate, and we want to share that joy with them. Yeah. So that's kind of like a building block again, and they are part of our community. Yeah. We all live together on this street, so we have to build the relationship. Absolutely. I would say um, I'm going to add this to kind of uh, like reflect on as organizers. We recognize that there's so many types of different relationships. 
private relationships are folks with your family. Private relationships are individuals that you like, uh, like connect with at home or whatever it may be. For organizers, we really believe on this idea of public relationships. So that you're cultivating a relationship with an individual based on like a common interest or values that you've articulated like in a public way. And so that actually distinguishes that question with subject you were asking, like, you know, how do I stay in touch with individuals? Like at, at any given message you may on Juma, you may give to them to like, I don't know, 20, 30 individuals. But the individuals that you're most curious about make it like your priority to like, you know, reach out to them. Not necessarily all 20 or 30, but like, you know, five, 10 people really stuck out to me for this reason. And I want to, to further develop my public relationship with them. And the, a public relationship from the organizing side is, do we understand an individual's values? Do we understand what their self-interest is? And like, once that's kind of like the foundational kind of uh, glue of that public relationship, it makes it much more logical and easier to maybe perhaps follow up with them. Um, and I will, in the same way that it's the adab of the Muslims that, you know, when you go to a certain city, meet with the people of knowledge there, like with the organizer parlance, it's the same. Anytime I'm in a certain city, I have to, if I'm in New York City, I got to meet with Michael Geekin, senior organizer from New York, late 70s, early 80s, was one of my mentors. It's just like uh, a, a thing. When I'm in LA, like when I'm back in LA, I got to meet with these folks. When I'm in Chicago, I got to meet someone from Iman, Inner City Muslim Action Network. It's just like this, it's a public relationship kind of ethos that we have. And again, I see those same parallels with us within internally in our community, I think. Oh, go right ahead. Please introduce yourself. And Wandered in and I just, bit. yeah, my name is Brittany, and I just came in. I heard people talking. Okay. Better go speak them. Welcome, Brittany. Cool. So I think it's 1.15. We'll take a break now, because I think Dohar's at 1.30, and then after Dohar, are we going to have lunch in this room? In the banquet hall. Cool. Exactly. Okay. I, I would also ask, I'm going to pass around a laptop uh, with just like a sign-in sheet, um, if you could fill it out. Also, like... Uh, so folks, it'll be easier for folks to get in touch with each other if they need to with that. Um, and uh, your, like interest areas, I think it'll make it easier for us maybe to put you in touch with each other accordingly afterwards. Sure. Or like if folks, the typically with the postcards, I usually add them on a spreadsheet and then I'll share that with you. That might be, if folks have these My Muslim Vote cards, just put your name, email, and phone on them. And then within the next, like before next week's training, we'll, I'll share that list with you. You know, they are um, policies and initiatives and things like that. That's how the. So, so if we're saying that power is the ability to move money or resources, what did the Koch brothers do? What are they? Providing money, the money, resources. The yeah. money, the money, and the resources to the candidates yeah. ahead of time, yep. and, and they're putting bet on it, right? So they're they're putting giving it to multiple. Um, exactly. Uh, candidates and hoping that once they get elected, they will do what they ask them to do. Got That's it. What power is. Um, what are some other examples of power? Thank you for that, Barbara. Thank you. Go right ahead, Ms. The way people um, try to blackmail uh, Ilhan Omar, so like the IPAC, and just she said something, but because they didn't like her, they started saying she was anti Semitic and all that stuff. So, and then they were racing using the media. And other mm -hmm. grassroots support to to paint her black. So being a bit more specific towards that, how um, and I can think of a uh, an example on the other side. So if, if there's power being used to kind of tarnish or like you know hurt Ilhan politically, how is their power being used to support or back her up? Cool. I think we may be going down. Like, I don't want to necessarily get into that example. The thing, go right ahead. Like the the support and the numbers um, after like what happened. Like, I think that we've seen a lot of dialogue, um, but I think that the people who came to support her, like welcoming her back into the airport and like physically 
um, being behind her, sure. I think, is what gave the other side power. Cool. Rihanna, did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, the way people responded to Ilhan as a symbol of power, as well as how AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez won, just in that case, it would be like moving people behind yep. them and moving people to vocalize behind them as well yeah. and support of them. Yeah. Yeah. So I think specifically, so one, there is power exerted by funding by different groups to kind of uh, portray Ilhan as anti-Semitic when she was making anti-Zionist statements, whatever, like the critique being there, but there was funding put there. There was people power to push in the other direction. So, you know, at the time that Ilhan initially made those statements back in January or February, uh, the House Speaker had decided that they were gonna introduce a resolution against anti-Semitism. People had mobilized, CARE was involved, Empower was involved to, uh, to pressure Pelosi's office to say that, no, this should not be a resolution on anti-Semitism, it should be a resolution on anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-blackness, and uh, and like all forms of discrimination. And so the resolution that was actually meant to introduce to kind of be like a political hit on Ilhan was completely lost of its teeth because people had mobilized, pressured Pelosi to introduce a joint, like a resolution bill that was much more inclusive. And so that was another instance of exerting some power. Um, and so I just wanted to, uh, we, I also want to think of power in a much more hyper local level. So this is a picture of a local election for neighborhood council in Los Angeles. I took this photo as I was waiting on lines for a local neighborhood council election for three hours. I was online for three hours. I don't even remember if you were in town that weekend, Sarah. So um, this is for a neighborhood council election that usually, since the neighborhood council system has been instituted in LA in like 1998, the most uh, people that have come out to vote have been like maybe 10,000. This election had like 19,000 people turn out. The poll, there was two polling locations for this specific election on a specific ballot initiative, but it took three hours. It was unheard of. I had dinner plans. I missed them completely. And I had to take a photo. I was like, what's going on here? There was some organizing going on here uh, without necessarily getting into the issue, or maybe I should. So basically, little Bangladesh had petitioned to take half of Koreatown and designate it as Little Bangladesh. Koreatown, which has been around for 20, 30 years, was saying that we are not having any of that. So they actually flexed and mobilized their power. The reason there was 19,000 people that turned out, the Korean like Business Association and some other Korean Cultural Association was but were bussing in voters from all over LA and some from Orange County, and they were allowed to do so to vote for this. So I should have stretched this picture out, but there, I was just taking a picture and documenting that people were coming off of buses to vote at the polls. Normally in an election that takes maybe 200, 300 people that usually turn out, this had 19,000. This is like the second highest voter turnout for a neighborhood council in the history of the neighborhood council system in the last 20 years in LA. And so that is power. There is an interest group that said that we have to turn out voters. We're going to do whatever it takes. We're going to bus people in from Orange County in, on, like, on a Wednesday or Thursday and have them vote. And like everyone had spent two or three hours at the lines. So, yeah. Uh, but in that situation, it was a couple of churches uh, that volunteered the buses. Because I started asking, like, hey, what's going on? It was like some several churches that had volunteered their buses to work in coordination with these associations. And the associations were also providing water and snacks. So I was able to get some snacks. I'm like, yo, it's like, I've been waiting online for two hours. <laughs> it's pretty hot. And people were just giving away um, like whatever they, uh, whatever they can to help that. So there was a demonstration of power there of like folks pooling non unconventional resources, bus, food, and moving voters. Yeah. And the, the, the Muslim community, so we're so like, they're Pakistanis, they're Indians, they're in, in Indonesian or whatever. We're so split each other so much that we forget about working in unity. So I'm working, I'm very much involved with the Genesis of Oakland. And I see how they run the place and I know how they work. They, go, they don't go to individuals in, the, in a church uh, and ask them to come and join. They actually go to the priest of the church. Unfortunately, most of the massages, they don't have a, you know, imam. So, or the leader and they say will you join us in doing that so it comes the movement all their movement comes from within but it comes from the leaders of the church so within the church organization they know okay how many people 
they will ask individual priests, how many people can we count on you on that event? And they give a number. If you don't show up with that number, the next time they will come and crucify you. Basically, they on the meeting they get embarrassed, they put them down, and I mean it's not. I don't think that's the right thing of doing it, but that's their way of sure. doing it. And that's right? public accountability. That is account accountability. Yeah. So you have to be. But so they involve the church and the leaders and the Muslim community. Where do you see the different masters doing anything together? So I mean that is leaves for discussions of how you structure your community and yeah, yeah. your power that's and all that. Does that care for bringing that up? So, um, what happened to one of my slides here? Sorry. Um, oh, there we go. Came in late. So, um, we often say within organizing that there's two ways of uh, how power often plays out. There's dominant power, which is you know someone pushing power over you, saying that hey, you have to like. There's martial law. There's a curfew. Everyone has to be in at 8 p.m. Or there could be relational power, which is lateral. And it's you know an elected official consulting with community members saying that, hey, this park needs to be open late because kids need to place to go after school. And so we say that there's these two kind of uh, ways of power. Can you guys guess what kind of power we prefer when like the community organizing side? Yeah. And so that actually means we're not, go we're not gonna shy away from working with people or working on with systems that don't share our values. We're just going to say that the terms of how we relate, you as an elected official that may be a Tea Party elected official in one part of New York, you have three of the largest mosques within like a hundred mile radius. You're going to have to, you know, provide support for these communities in the ways that they need, if it's around zoning, whatever it is. So the idea is that when we, when communities engage in power, you want it to be lateral, but there's a way of how you like engage with elected officials. So one, they respond to the power of like votes and funding. And when you're in a dominant power dynamic, when you have like a hyper conservative or somebody that an elected official that's in a power position that does not share your values, you have to understand and recognize that, you know, that's the dynamic that they understand. Then you have to start thinking, what are the versatile tactics to like pressure them around? Is it like a public media campaign to make them look bad because they don't want to lose the popularity of like their uh, of their like a chance for winning an election down the line, and so the and I'll kind of share this photo right here or explain a bit about this. Can folks see what this photo is of? Yeah, so this is actually in Congress in front of House uh, Speaker Paul Ryan's office. Sarah, do you remember what year this was? Twenty seventeen. Yeah, I think last year, yeah, before the flip. Yeah, so this, so this one was specifically around when President Trump had announced that uh, he was going to uh, phase out DACA, deferred arrival uh, for uh, undocumented youth on a pathway to citizenship. So our organization, as well as several other organizations, had decided that, you know, we're going to take faith leaders to go to the House Speaker and encourage him to reconsider and like introduce a clean immigration reform bill act. Paul Ryan's office did not want to meet with us. So what did we actually an anticipated that? So we realized that there was a power over situation. His office was not even going to meet with us. We decided relationally, what are we going to do? We're going to have a, a slew of faith leaders. I think there's about 20 or 30 of us there that we're going to sit down in front of his office and do a civil disobedience. So we got arrested. We were in jail for like, or we were held detained for a little less than half of a day. Um, and an interesting note with this, um, Imam Omar Suleiman from Texas was part of this group and he got arrested with us. Uh, and I was asking him like, okay, so like, uh, why are you doing this, this? Like he flew in from Dallas that morning, was outside for some of the speeches and then we immediately mobilized inside. Um, he's like, Shrak, I actually have to leave right after, he was planning to leave right after the, uh, the action. And so, you know, we got, uh, the group had gotten arrested, and then he, while we were being detained, all everyone's cell phones, all their electronics were being confiscated. But as soon as we got out, I'm looking at my phone, and I see a slew of social media saying that Imam Omar Suleiman got arrested. We need to find out if he's safe, is there going to be a bail, all this, that, the other. Imam Omar, I think as soon as he got back to Texas, he had messaged saying that, you know, I got arrested for a reason. I had, you know, wanted to demonstrate that, you know, Faith leaders care about undocumented youth within the community, and there are Muslims here. Not even that, he like mentioned that statement, and the following day, 
he had a conversation like this, like a table conversation at his Islamic center, I believe, where it was him and two undocumented Muslim youth speaking about the, like providing education around DACA and why it's important that there should be a pathway to citizenship. So like he had used an opportunity and like flexing the power of moving people because people are very agitated and thinking, why did he get arrested? What's going on? And he used that opportunity to uh, use his power to provide more political education for folks to push around uh, like immigration reform. And as folks know, as it stands right now, the Supreme Court's going to make a decision on whether or not Trump's executive order on rescinding DACA is constitutional. And then there's always this continual legislative advocacy push to um, advocate for clean immigration reform. And so this was one of those dynamics that I just wanted to describe a little bit of power. Next, um, we're going to just break up again into groups. Let's play a little bit. So it's 2.45 right now. Is it okay if we go over to like 3.10? Or do folks want to, uh, and I'll do that, whatever the group feels. If, does anybody, if anyone has an opposition, you are, we'll break at 3 o'clock so that folks can leave, and then we'll continue to wrap, and look to wrap by 3.10. Um, so the, I want to maybe have folks break off into pairs and let's literally just spend two minutes an individual, uh, telling a story of how you were acted on by a dominant power. And if there was anything that you could have done about it and a dominant power being like, you know, a government institution, law enforcement and, or like a corporation, anything that gives an example of like how power was exercised in a way that you as an individual did not have power, but there was one power was only coming from a one way path. So if folks just want to break into pairs and speak to that, uh, tell each other. And then I'm only going to take maybe two stories of that. And I went to like say something to him, but he he physically pushed me, and I was like, okay, this man has a gun. It's like three times my size, and we were and like and nothing that I could have said, nothing that would have calmed him down. Like even his partner was a, like looked like he didn't verbally say anything against him, but just like okay, there's like three old aunties that are African American looking, and this is like South Asian guy, and he had a gun, and we were just literally going to a place where he had a permit to take uh, action. In that moment, perhaps not. But that was a moment where we were like, okay, there is power over over here. I think in the aftermath of that um, action, we could have demonstrated power with like, okay, who at the NYPD is the community base? And how do we bring pressure to those folks? Uh, have it for yourself. Make of them not being able to see their grandparents and their uh, uh, cousins and uncles and aunts and, you know, and so um, I think that's definitely a, a active dominant power <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe we'll take one more quick example Brown ladies, so. uh, i think the closest one because there's quite a few of them but last wednesday um tuesday night i heard that the city of council of uh, uc of berkeley is just about to drop the discussion on um, the banning of facial recognition technology. Yep. Yep. Now, there is an organization here uh, that I helped with the city of Oakland to get it activated, and uh, they have started a commission. And uh, the attorney who's there leading it is just an incredible person. So San Francisco adopted that. 
the Board of Supervisors yep. about three weeks ago, ban facial recognition uh, technology from being in the future. It's, the technology is already there. You yep. just need somebody needs to switch it on. This stops the switching from happening. Then Oakland uh, approved it on Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. And Wednesday, I heard that, and I got a very strong message that Berkeley was going to have a drop it. So Tuesday night at 10 p.m., I had a law not to call anybody, but I found myself really texting and mm. anyway. So by Wednesday noon, which was very hard to get people out of their job, uh, I was able to get six people to talk to the city council passionately, including I. Mm. I started it with a reference to the blockbuster movie Minority Report, mm. if anybody remembers that. And it apparently it uh, struck a nerve with a lot of people. Anyway, now the legislation and the ordinance is on uh, agenda for next meeting to be voted on, and I'm quite definitely sure it will be a positive uh, to stop it from happening. So I guess that the lesson from this is that organizing does work, yep. and, and if you can react fast, the problem is majority of us in the Bay Area, we live in a bubble, everybody's working for a high-tech company, and everybody's basically enslaved by this so-called notion of career is another discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Brother Saladin's example was a little bit of like, you know, power with how do they engage with elected officials to kind of move or push back on uh, the surveillance thing, which has been like a, all eyes are on this campaign right here, the work, work around surveillance here, uh, pushing back on surveillance technology. Um, so I now I want to jump into like, we talked about different kind of modes of power. And I really wanted to jump into like the one of the organizing kind of frameworks of how we view public life. Um, and this is simple and it's a little bit reduced, but I think it covers a lot of the, like the organization and entities of how we relate publicly. So again, I wanna make the distinction that there's a distinction between like an individual as a, as a private individual and then someone that engages in the public. So I as a private individual happen to ride my bike, but I as a public individual advocate for creating bike lanes in the city that I belong to, independent of who I am privately. So when we say in public, and in public life is where decisions are being, uh, like decisions and policies are being enacted and legislated on. So we say that within public life, there are three main kind of sectors where power is being exerted. Uh, so the first sector is the public sector. And the public sector is where there's elected officials, either at the municipal level, state level, or the national level, and then agencies that are, you know, operationalizing and, you know, using your budget, like our tax dollars to, like, you know, do everything from, like, public safety and to, like, paving the streets to, like, um, to, like, uh, like, regulating on, like, health through the FDA. So we say that, you know, within that sector, the power is within those people and those elected officials and those positions. And the values that they have is, you know, is the value for the public sector is that exert a certain level of administration and control around in public life. The next sector is the private sector. And so the private sector, we say, are typically corporations or companies that look to that whose value is to maximize profit. So if you're in, and again, this is where there's a little bit of reductionist happening, reductionist defini definitions. But in the private sector, ideally, or theoretically, an organization is looking to maximize their profit and are not necessarily informed by ethics or morals or concerns of a community. So if a developer comes in and wants to build a slew of condos, they may not even be thinking of building in affordable, like a 20% allowance for affordable housing units. And so we say that in the private sector, or uh, companies and developers are informed by their, or their, their main value is maximizing their profit. And so then the last sector is the civic sector. Uh, the civic sector is typically what uh, organizers have defined as, you know, families, religious congregations that show up publicly. Like this is a publicly registered space as a nonprofit. This is an entity where people come and congregate together. Um, and they're, they're in participating in public life because they are within the community uh, and in relation with other organizations around. Um, we say labor unions, civic associations, and advocacy nonprofits are also within that same uh, realm of the civic sector. What we say is that the values for the civic sector can be varied. We wrote all other motives, but the idea is that a religious congregation, their values may be motivated by altruism or 
doing like uh, like propagation, like doing dawa, or if it's like a a nonprofit that does believes in conservancy, they believe their value is to make their earth like more sustainable or environmental friendly, and the power that they have, excuse me, is their ability to organize people and money. We often say that in the civic sector, finances are probably not on the same scale as they are in the government uh, sector, in the public sector or the private sector. But there is fundraising that can happen and the thing, change that can happen at the hyper-local level. We were mentioning at lunch that Ayanna Presley, who won in Massachusetts, her campaign budget was $100,000, which is like unheard of, like a very like, minuscule budget to win at a federal level. So the idea is that, you know, the civic sector may not be deprived of organizing funding. We just have to think through, like, what's the best, like, are there other resources that we can mob, uh, mobilize and organize around? Um, the key thing, uh, the other kind of lasting lesson I want for us to understand in public life is we try to imagine public life and these three sectors as a stool. So a stool will not stand up if one of the legs is broken. So if you have a one leg, if it's a government sector that it's overextending its reach, that it's longer than the others, then the, the pub public life will be crooked. Same thing goes with the private sector. And same thing applies for the civic sector. We actually need to have engaged individuals and engaged civic uh, organizations that can compete uh, or engage in power dynamics with the other two sectors. And I'm hoping that this would uh, illustrate that. Do folks have any questions or thoughts around this? Is this the first time that they've seen this kind of uh, explanation of public life? Cool. So when, um, so when we've mentioned that you know within the civic sector, money may sometimes be a challenge for uh, to fundraise on the same scale as the private and the public sector. What is it that we can do to actually build our people power? And so. This concept of base building is what uh, comes in. And this is actually going to tie into what our next step is. Uh, base building is this idea of growing a group of leaders by understanding, like building relational uh, ties with them to understand what are, your value, what are the values that you have? Are there common values that we have that motivate us to be on the same side of an issue? And within that base building, we, when we're engaging in public relationships, we're asking folks that as you as an organizer, you're going to be making asks to individuals to help implement whatever vision or cause that you have. And so when we're base building, the idea is that we're talking to a lot of people within our community who we may have a hunch shares the same values as us or may even further share the same position on an issue. The thing is you want to get folks together in a room and start organizing collectively. Brother Tarek had mentioned that community organizing is something that, you know, when you're organizing people collectively towards uh, an issue or a cause, that's what community organizing is. And to us, the fundamental piece is base building. So the idea is you as an individual may have had one-to-ones with a dozen people. The next step for that is all those individual conversations you've had, you want to bring a little bit of synergy to that. Let's bring people together in a room and have a larger conversation uh, around that issue that we have. And I'll share a quick uh, story around this. This was an April 2012, I was driving back from Chicago to New York. My cousin who lives in Canada gave me a call and I missed his call and he just texted me or something saying that, hey, give me a call back, got to talk to you about something. So I call him up and I'm like, hey, so I'm like, what's going on? And he goes like, hey, I just got to be like upfront with you. Sajid just was diagnosed with cancer. And I was like, oh, Sajid is my nephew. He was about eight years old at that time. So there's a little bit of silence. And I'm like, okay, so what do we do? And he's like, uh, I'm not sure, but make dua right now. Your other cousin's coming from Virginia up to Canada to kind of, and she's a doctor. We're going to just kind of see like what the next steps are. So through that long drive and several phone calls between Chicago and New York, my cousin um, who went to Canada, SubhanAllah, she was just like, okay, we recognize that there's a gap with uh, South Asians on the bone marrow registry. So what we have to do is one, everybody has to do a cotton swab in our family, in our extended family to see if there's a match there and just be entered into the registry. And then two, we have to like just create more of this awareness around it. And so as I'm driving through and she's telling me this, I'm like, okay, uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to go back to New York after I've been in Chicago for about a year. I, uh, what I ended up doing is I went to my mosque and I was like, listen, guys, like uh, I started talking to some of the leaders there and some of the youth group kids that I was working with and asked them like, okay, guys, or telling them that there's this issue. My nephew, it's a very personal, selfish interest thing, 
has been diagnosed with leukemia, the only probability for his uh, like his cure is like you know getting a bone marrow match, which they have not found right now. What we're going to do is I want to have a like a run a bone marrow registry, a cotton swab registry, at all the South Asian mosques that I can uh, think of within Long Island. So alhamdulillah. And actually, this is before I was married to my wife. Sarah actually helped uh, coordinate some of that in Minnesota, where she was from. Uh, but at that time, I was I had a sense of a vision that I was hit by a personal moment, and I knew that the vision was, or the, my pathway to a solution was, get as many South Asians on the registry as possible. And I was like, okay, I have to start building a base. So I got in front of some of the uncles, asked them, you know, this is what I want to do. Went to Juma, made an announcement saying that, hey, we're going to be doing these cotton swab drives next Juma. And then I needed to find, an, and so I, then I needed to find a base of youth that was going to do the work with me. So I recruited, made the pitch to a, a slew of kids that from like, 12 to probably like freshman year of college to hunt me out. And on that day, uh, the following Friday, I think we got um, probably like 40 or 50 folks. Our mosque congregation is relatively small, but on that first week, we got 40 or 50. We continued for the next couple of weeks. And we made sure that everybody within our extended family in New York uh, was also registered. So to me, um, that, uh, that had some kind of uh, teachable moments of what base building was, and that my initial cousin who was went from Virginia to Toronto, she was the organizer in this. She tapped every single cousin of ours saying that y'all got to get registered on, like put your cotton swab thing on the registry and then see what we can do to maximize bone marrow registrations. Uh, and then I would say that I played a small role in that because I was able to find a base of youth group leader, or youth group uh, kids that ended up doing, like being bought in on this vision that you know they don't want to see like a young kid suffer, and they also recognize systemically that South Asians are underrepresented in the registry. So we were able to identify on values, and I had uh, I made a specific ask. I asked them to help volunteer with it, and they had done it. Um, so that story in and of itself, my, alhamdulillah, my nephew uh, he did return to Allah uh, actually later that year, but he did find a bone marrow match. It was that the chemo had been too intense for him, and subhanAllah, Allah is the best of planners, but he had. We had, whatever our campaign was, we did whatever was within our means, and then uh, and we did what was within our means, and we knew that all things come from Allah. But we, I saw that as a success, because the youth that I engaged with, we became tighter. And I was several years older than them. And I was able to tap into them for 2012, 2013, excuse me, 2014, for all the other electoral campaign and other issues that we were working on within uh, our mosque there. And it all started with, you know, a simple base building ask, like, hey, can you commit to doing this kind of work? Then we understood that we shared the sim similar values, and we had a vision of how we can improve our community. And then 2013, we did voter registration at that mosque. Tw also, at the end of 2013, we drove people to a town hall. We were going and canvassing in different areas. So the idea is that when you're base building, it's, uh, you use specific issues, perhaps, as an opportunity to engage and recruit people, make an ask. But it's not a transactional relationship. After that quote unquote campaign was over, I've just found a group of folks that were ready to put in the work and to do, uh, to do whatever it takes to like, help improve the community. And that's how we want to kind of imagine what base building for us is. That you know, the individuals that we're working with right now, it may not be their priority and self-interest to work on this specific issue, but they share the same values as you. And it starts by asking, like making a concrete ask around a specific issue, the folks that, you know, end up working with you, or chances are they're the going to be the ones that are going to work with you on campaigns uh, beyond that. Um, and just kind of building a bit more effective uh, asks are based on relationships. So these are actually Mahad and Al Maruf. These are two of the guys. Uh, they, this is them doing voter registration work, probably in 2013. Uh, yeah, in our, that looks like our office. But these are the two kids that I had mentored through youth group that were the two. Uh, Al, for sure, was one of the volunteers that was like making sure that people were doing the cotton swab, doing all the little things that showed to me that, hey, he's somebody that like was activated and motivated enough that he would do something without like me actually pushing him around it. And Mahad is actually one of the most charismatic canvassers that I had met. So I got to know these two individually and knew what their strengths were. And they trusted me enough that, OK, like, you want us to canvas in New York after, so not after Hurricane Sandy, but in November, it gets pretty cold in New York. The temperature drops in the 30s and 40s. These guys, it also helped that I was, we were paying them. We had, we had a stipend for them. But they were committed to doing civic engagement, doing voter registration work and knocking on doors. 
But this all came because I can, I try as consistently as an organizer, the leaders that I've worked with, I understand where, like what's motivating them. Why would they be interested? And they understand that I'm transparent and an open book, the reason that we're doing this work. And so we want, as we're doing this base building work, we want to know as much as we can about that person, what do they care about and why do they care about it? The second picture is uh, at the Arab American Association of New York. This is actually this past, this is past November. Um, so we were doing our broad My Muslim Vote campaign where we were making sure that individuals that had Muslim, that these are just voter rolls. I think we were making phone calls to Muslim voters to make sure that they were turning out for their uh, midterm elections. And again, so the Arab American Association of New York, there was an organizer there. It was Reem and Noha that was able to organize and bring out aunties and uh, like a women-led group doing the civic engagement work. And it's because of the relationships that they had. And so uh, the kind of piece around uh, like in get a base building is that not every individual will do everything that you ask of them. And that's completely okay. And in the same way that we say that, you know, we're doing, Empower Change is doing a My Muslim Vote campaign. We are very much aware that there's several individuals in our community that are not eligible to vote, uh, may not be citizens, but can still be involved in different aspects of the campaign. So we really buy into this theory of this ladder of engagement. And I'll read this uh, for time's sake. I'm sorry, it's 3.10, so if folks need to leave, I can um, make a move, I apologize. Uh, but I heard the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, whoever of you sees an evil, let him change it with his hand. And if he is not able to do so, then let, let him change it with his tongue. And if he is not able to do so, then with his heart. And that is the weakest of faith. So our idea is that different people will enter public life work at the level that they're comfortable at. We want to always create the pathway to say, like, if we have a vision for a campaign or the work that we're doing, like, we want to see you being able to do X, Y, Z work, but we will meet you where you're at. If I had, I had a volunteer, Ariel, who was looking for community service hours from a local community college, she did not like getting in front of people and registering voters or talking to them face to face, but she was great at talking on the phone. The minute that she was able to express that to me, I was like, okay, that's a no brainer. You don't have to go outside in like 30 degree weather, just kind of stay inside, drive phone calls, and we'll like make that work. So that like, it was just kind of recognizing where individuals were at and making, uh, making the accommodation in, the, in your work plan or in your campaign uh, to do so. And um, so, uh, so that was just a bit around base building. And the exercise that we're going to do, I'm like two slides from wrapping up, um, is going to be around like how do we think intentionally about uh, building our base um, and like recruiting people to our vision. So I wanted to lift up a few things. Sisters and Zarina had, has been passing around, oh, the agenda to change our condition, a uh, book by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid. Uh, and there's a chapter specifically on civic engagement and social justice. Um, this is a classic. I recall reading it several years ago, but I had to ask you what chapter had the, uh, the condition, uh, chapter five, on being in, engaged in the community. The other book that I wanted to share is uh, Imam Dawood Walid out of Michigan. He runs CARE Michigan. He wrote this book earlier this year, Towards Sacred Activism. And in this book, it's a bit shorter than that book, but he ties in that our faith values and our desire and like our command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do good and to forbid the unfair is what should be driving us to be active in our work. So I recommend this book as a way to kind of think through like what is a bit of our visioning as spiritual people in public life of why we're motivated to do work. And the reason I say this is because this is the kind of work that resonated with me when my mass leaders at Muslim American Society were telling me that, you know, it's our religious, it's part of our religious practice to wanting to improve the communities around us. Um, and I will wrap there before we go into the exercise. I know I just kind of rushed through power, base building, and vision and mission, but I just love to kind of get some quick thoughts or reflections on those three pieces. is that we're all so different as a person, as an individual. So the person that you're building relationship, they're not technically your, your family. And you, look, you don't look at them as a family, but it's uh, 
you're working on these issues on the transactional level and you take it at that level and don't take anything to heart and personal, you know, and yeah. you're working on the issues. And I think one of the things, that's one of the things I would say about this kind of work. It's hard, but, uh, you know, you, we are Muslims, we are brothers uh, in faith but and sisters, but at the same time, I think we should look at it, the bigger picture and how it has been working so far. Yeah, absolutely. Yama Rashid, were you all going to say something? I was just gonna, uh, I was just gonna bring up really quickly. I probably should have brought up earlier, but um, so it's just been in my experience in life that, you know, with 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 money comes power. I think we all kind of realize that that's a that's a big end. Um, and, I, and going back to the the public sector versus the private sector versus the civic sector, um, just just wondering your thoughts with like how important it is to uh, seek out uh, grants and opportunities from. Uh, the public sector for the civic sector because there was no line drawing that connection uh, in the in the chart. Sure. Yeah, and I think um, uh, that chart uh, there can always be layers added to it. But uh, in terms of funding, we understand that you know Ishraq as an individual may be part of the civic sector, but say if Ishraq's a local elected official, he's in the public sector, and if some Ishraq's in the private sector and he's a donor, then. We look at him that way. So we recognize that there's actually a lot of lines of how powers engage across the sectors. And it be, the picture becomes a bit more complicated of how we engage. The key thing here is just to understand that, hey, if I'm in the civic sector and I need to work with Mayor Eric Garcetti, who's been terrible on issues of surveillance, but he, he has made a public commitment to work on uh, resolving homelessness by creating, like, I love this homeful <laughs> like term, like building more affordable housing in the city of LA. Guess what? We're going to work with this, the mayor of Los, of Los Angeles around homelessness while holding accountable on another issue that we have. And so this just means our, the, the ways in which we engage with each sector, it becomes more layered and nuanced. And it makes it much more difficult to, you know, be in a culture where like, hey, I'm going to not work with that individual at all. I think there's pieces where, you know, if we stay, hold true to our values, inevitably we're not going to be working with certain groups on certain issues. And there's a way to like be respectful and demarcate that, that, hey, like I may work with this certain community on issues of like human rights or civil rights, but I'm not going to work on a particular, like say marriage equality issue within the, the, the Muslim community. But it's just kind of recognizing that our public life relationships are not going to be trans, like aspects of it may be transactional of how we work on a campaign, but the relationships are going to be a bit more nuanced and layered. And as the, the clearer we are on our values, and we are explicit about it. And Imam Dawood mentions this in his book. If we, are, if we lead with our values and connect the reason that we work on certain issues to our values, it, people will respect and organizations and entities will respect when you know, a certain organization will not work on this issue but will collaborate on something else. Um, any other thoughts before we just jump into next steps? I know I'm like, scrambling to wrap up right now. Cool. Oh, go right ahead. Okay. Yes, I was wondering prior to this about uh, the, uh, the story of Omar bin Khattab saying, I just wish for a room fee filled of people as Abu Abaydah bin Jarrah. Abu Abaydah bin Jarrah is the one who led uh, the battles against the Romans uh, in Jordan, etc. And I just, and I know you're in a rush, so I'll make it very short. I, uh, I actually like I I see that he understands the value of transformation of people and how hard it is to move and anybody who's working in social justice or working against Islamophobia these days or anything will recognize how difficult it is to as we can see today we should have had much more larger number but I'm actually happy with the with the number as is but it's very hard to activate people. And it tells you that he understood the religion, that if you want to be a believer, then you have to be an activist. There's just no thing. And it's very difficult to activate. So I I keep on reflecting on that. And I say, God bless him. You know, He understood what this religion means and how difficult it is to transform people. Yeah. God bless him. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things now we'll jump into a bit of our next next steps is I want to kind of 
tell people about our vision at Empower Change, uh, and that with the hopes that you know we recognize that a lot of people share the energy and enthusiasm around our campaign, but it's always difficult to activate people to wanting to push along with the work. Um, so this series of trainings, as I mentioned from the beginning, was an opportunity for us to provide some political education to the community, and then more so plug into opportunities and the vision that we have for 2020 and beyond. So for us at Empower, we believe that you know 2016 was a toxic election year, not only for Muslims, but for a lot of emerging minority communities, marginal, non-white uh, communities because of the narrative that the current president had used. But this was something that was actually not new for the Muslim community, uh, particularly like in the post 9-11 era. And I can speak to New York that back in like even in 2010, there was uh, what was known as a ground zero mosque in lower Manhattan. That year in that midterm election, that the Muslim community in New York City was used as that punching back because it was like the Muslim community that was building a ground zero mosque that had this connotation around 9-11 was a reason why elected officials should not be engaging with Muslims around this. And we were basically like a, again, like a political punching bag around that. And it was in that same year that a congressman from uh, New York called for these Muslim hearings where he was going to have Muslims testify in the radicalization of Islam or whatever it may be. And so we, uh, we've recognized, and particularly a lot of New York organizers saw that, you know, what happened in 2016 is just like another amplification of what happened at that local level. We've made a commitment that, you know what, like our kind of community reputation, our community identity is not going to be used as a punching bag anymore, like around this. And so we've tried to make this commitment to like really change the broad narrative of how Muslims are engaging in election years and beyond. So last year, two years ago, we started this My Muslim Vote campaign. Last year was the first year that we were able to experiment and try engaging several different communities throughout the states. So last year, we had recruited about 42 different organizations across 15 states to do voter registration work, uh, to do phone banking, and then to do uh, low-level like uh, workshops around civic engagement, and you know just kind of canvassing and being involved in the general election process. So on a single day, we had you know through those 42 partners, we registered around a thousand voters uh, on what we called National Muslim Voter Registration Day. And so my ask to everyone in this room is that you know. We want to continue and literally double those numbers. Last year we had 42 organizations. Now we want to double that to bring it up to like 80 or just under 100 organizations that can do. This is an easy vanilla ask. Like you, Zarino was mentioning, we end up doing a lot of civic engagement work. But our idea is that if we do this with the right intentionality and the relational kind of culture around it, it can yield to something bigger. And like, we think that you know voter registration is a stepping stone into understanding what are the local issues that are impacting community members. And then once you have understood what local issues that are impacting community members, there you have a base of leaders that can start engaging around that issue all year round beyond the election year. And so like, um, we have several opportunities around that, but we do believe that you know, our, uh, from Empower Change, our bird's eye view, we're seeing that you know, Muslims uh, amongst the three Abrahamic faiths, we're actually the lowest number of, uh, like the ratio of uh, people that identify with the faith that are registered to vote, we're actually on the lower end. We're about, that was a state that we should have been a bit more active in. So <clears throat> our vision is that there's a trickle down effect. If Muslims are engaging the civic engagement process in 2020 and beyond, that elected officials and other uh, power holders in the, the government sector will be held accountable to us. That they know that, oh, we have a Muslim bloc that we actually have to be, uh, we have to share uh, their position on the issues that, that they have. And so for us, the pitch is that, you know, we're asking communities and community leaders to do what we call vanilla campaigns. Really smooth, really easy, you know, voter registration work, civic engagement work with us. And we try to provide that larger narrative around it. Last year, we had placed um, uh, like media coverage in local NPR, some radio stations up here. USA Today and a few other like national uh, media outlets around our civic engagement work, and we are we are keen that this is the role that Empower can play in providing some support. So what that actually means is, I'd love for folks to be engaged not only in our My Muslim Vote campaign, but uh, into the pieces of what the this series of trainings is about. Next week we're having this training with Poly Polygon. Sorry, I should be yelling into this. 
uh, Polygon specializes in legislative advocacy on the Hill. And they will have uh, like a, a unique skill set and a contribution to how we engage with our elected officials. And I'd love to see individuals uh, from this community right here, from folks that are attending right now, turn out and bring one or two other folks that are not in this room today, but that are part of the network. Like Brother Salahuddin had recruited two or three folks in here before he, was, he had even walked in. And I'm hoping and anticipating that he would do the same for the next several weeks. Um, so that training is going to be coming up. Uh, and then two weeks after that, we're actually going to be doing listening sessions. So today, and the legislative advocacy session has a little bit about like throwing vocabulary at folks, talking about kind of like the conceptual idea of organizing. The listening sessions and these town halls are the opportunity that we just kind of start going into the, like the weeds of ba actual base building. And base building only works after you've had relational meetings. So um, I know we're going to be doing uh, listening sessions August 3rd, August 4th, both here and in Oakland. And for anyone that's registered or emailed, we'll be sending information on that. But I'm looking to you as leaders to be able to bring other folks into those conversations, into those trainings, so that we can start actually building on some of the concepts that we talked about. The other uh, few things that we're doing under our My Muslim Vote campaign, as you can see, a lot of our photos are, have to do with voter registration work uh, and some GOTV work, people are phone banking. Um, we really want to be able to frame this narrative that you know this is women-led, youth-led, and it's, our community is diverse. And that you know this is the kind of electoral base that the Muslim community is. And then from that, it even trickles down to like at the state and local level that these communities care about a slew of diverse issues. But is there like a common through line of values that we have that say that you know we are for like you know taking care of the homeless, for health care, for like e equal labor rights? And so we believe that the listening sessions that we're going to be conducting is an opportunity for us to kind of call together the different issues that communities are, are um, concerned about. So very practically put, for the My Muslim Vote campaign, we are going to be hosting a series, we are anticipating to host a series of listening sessions leading to the 2020 elections. And whatever issues that we hear there, we're going to be asking participants to share that with us on a survey. So that come next year uh, around the Democratic National Convention and into the summer, we're going to be able to say that we've surveyed 200 different communities uh, across the states. And not only did we do it just like on a black and white survey, but we were relational. We got community members to know one another, and we were able to say that, you know, in Pleasanton, folks care about homelessness and language access. In New York, they care about redistricting and immigration reform. So we wanted, like, our vision is that we want to be engaging as many Muslim communities in this relational process to share these issues at the national level. And then a few other things is, um, has folks heard of this documentary called Time for Ilhan? So Ilhan Omar had run for state senate prior to her running for Congress. There was a documentary made about her, which was um, which was pretty inspirational. We're going to be we see that that as an opportunity to encourage more conversation, particularly for women of color to be running for office or to be engaged in the civic engagement process. So we are uh, going to be facilitating free host uh, watch parties around that film, and we think that that's an opportunity for a local community to bring people in the door to watch a documentary and then have a conversation of how to get involved. Time for Ilhan. And we'll send a follow-up around this. And so uh, from our end of it, you can sign up at mymuslimvote.org, and then uh, you can take my email address down and feel free to message me, and we can follow up. Um, so I kind of went through a slew of that, and I want to now talk about explicit action items. Does that work, Fran? Yeah, OK. Yeah, so here um, our vision is, or y'all fill in the blanks for me. What is a kind of a collective vision that we may have here in this room? Cool. Our vision is to get more Muslim engagement. Um, what's a process that we can do that? What's like a what are some of the steps that we can get more Muslim engagement around? Come into where? Absolutely. So that's, you figured out my formula. So like if this was a, a campaign for us, our campaign is between now and August 3rd at the very least. This is our timeline. Our vision is that we want to increase Muslim engagement. Our process is that we want to do one-to-ones with people in our network. And I would love for folks to write this down as next steps. Think of doing at least 10 one-to-ones 
between now and August 3rd. So five between now and next week, and five between uh, the legislative advocacy session to August 3rd. To the people that you think may be interested, that, ha that share the same concern of wanting to, the Muslim community to be involved, and make that hard ask, as Farhan was saying, that make the hard ask, or by hard ask, we're saying a very concrete, specific goal that folks can go towards, which is attend a training. Uh, one of these, this series of trainings that we're doing, and learn about how like the movement to kind of build collective power. Yes, that would be great. <laughs> what did you do to convince? Yeah. What did you? I, I, I just had the luxury of having uh, the khutbah yesterday at uh, <laughs> Pleasanton, and down. and then uh, and the khutbah was all about civic engagement and the need of, and then I was actually fired up because I, it's been a few weeks of very heavy civic engagement, and every time I have a function, I struggle to bring one or two people with me to any major function. I actually have an ask for people here for a future uh, lobbying of Congress or for a local representative here that they might help me if you allow me. But anyway, so that's how it is. Um, inshallah, I plan also to bring people to your other event at uh, Oakland uh, there because I have a lot of influence there, inshallah, and, and we'll move it forward. And the whole idea is, is just such as you're trying to mobilize people here, I am also trying to mobilize for different similar reasons is to be active in the local. My hope, as I said, to have 50 representatives in office, actual Muslims. And then there's quite a few Senate races that are going, local Senate races that the Muslims can participate in. I'm actually very active with a couple of people running for Senate, that is California Senate. So there's a lot in my mind, thanks. Okay, thank you. You think? I've been looking with the church community, working with them for the past two years, literally on these issues. This community is very comfortable. So when there's comfort, they also have connection. So with the connection, they don't want to do anything. I think one of the most important things I've seen is the role play of a hard ass. You asked me training, you asked me. You're asking, you're asking, got it, cool. Okay. So um, we'll model this a bit. So so the context is that Farhan and I, I've, I've reached out to him awkwardly last week. I'm like, hey, I've never met. Literally, it's my first time meeting him in person. We've been emailing back and forth a better uh, course of like two months, right? Right. <laughs> so uh, it's like, hey, man, I'm glad that you invited me to like come out to this training. We'd love to grab coffee with you uh, so we could talk about after, talk after the training. Right. All that happened, this is the context, now we're in the coffee shop talking. Yeah. Hey, Salam alaikum Farhan, thanks for meeting with me. Yeah, sure. Happy to be here. Cool. Yeah. You know, I really appreciate you doing the, like, from what I understand, you're on the board for Polygon, right? Right. Uh, what motivated you to be on the board of Polygon? Um, you know, I, I was, uh, just saw that, you know, 2016 was a really hard moment for this country, and I think that Muslims need to be more engaged in Congress. Uh, I was actually worked on the campaign in, in Arizona, and there were not a lot of, a lot of what I had to say about the Muslim community felt like it fell on deaf ears. Um, and uh, that was hard, but I, I realized that that many more of us need to get out um, so that people uh, see us. Yeah, absolutely. I hear that. You know, 2016 was also a moment for me. I was not organizing the Muslim community, but I had this kind of crisis moment that I was meeting a lot of Muslims. And I also felt that, you know, this presidential ca the campaign was targeting on Muslims, like from the Muslim ban to creating a Muslim registry. And I felt like, you know, we, I need to be a part of that process. And so that's part of what brought me to Empower. Um, so I'm curious, like, you've been doing this work with Polygon. Uh, have you yourself been able to, like, be a part of the trainings? Or have you just been kind of running around and, like, putting events together? Um, more so just putting events together. You I, know, I don't really have time for trainings. Uh, to, to go on events and, like, events. Got it. You know, so part of what we're doing at Empower, we're working with Polygon, of course. And Ignore that, it's kind of little gap. Yeah, yeah. And, and care, but uh, you know, we're doing a series of trainings for the next couple of weeks, and it's building on what you just mentioned, that, you know, that feeling that you had in 2016, that our issues that were not being felt or heard, like we are do this is a direct response to the feeling that a lot of Muslims and Muslim orgs felt after 2016. So we're gonna be doing this training on teaching how uh, Muslims can start to build their power by engaging with elected officials. Uh, it's gonna be in Oakland, and I know you're out in Oakland, right? Yeah, close close to so would you be able to attend? It's only going to be like three hours. Um, 
with lunch included. I don't, I'm not sure exactly uh, if I can make that day. Is there, yeah, I don't know. So we're actually doing a series of trainings, so it's not going to be just on that day. We'd love to have you, like, come on board with it. Yeah. And our idea is that, you know, if you can't make one training, it's not the end of the world. We still want you to be involved, and it sounds like you are doing a lot of work. So I'd love to make sure that if you don't make, if you can't make that training, uh, would you be able to even come out for maybe like an hour towards the end? Um, yeah, maybe I can try that. Cool. So what I'll do is, uh, you know, I'll actually follow up with you because I'll be doing the training or I'll be attending, yeah. and I don't want to be the only stranger in the room. So if you come through, that would be great. Maybe I'll just give you a call like a few days before the event to make sure that you're going to join. Sure. Awesome. Huh? Great. Um, so in that kind of modeling, and we did that. Really yeah, uh, and of course, in different ways. But the idea is that I was persistent with asking him if he wants to attend uh, a training and just kind of understand that, hey, he may not be able to attend. And so, um, actually, I'll stop. What, uh, how was that interaction? Was it natural? Did it sound like there was, like, is that something that folks would pull off with the community? Hmm? Was a bit more pushy. One thing yeah. that, if it was a bit more pushy, one thing, like, when you're working on campaigns, like political campaigns, we're actually encouraged to ask. I don't know. Yeah. We're, we're encouraged not to use uh, yes or no questions even. So I, I think like in, um, it's often, well, not even just yes or no, but using the language of like, can I count on you? Can I count on you to see to see you next week? Um, which, you know, I don't know. I, I leave it up to each of you to say like, what is it? How, how pushy do you want to be? It was, when I was working on campaigns, like it can be very uncomfortable. You know, making people feel feeling like you're pushing somebody into something, and that is certainly that's not the intention with any of this. We want all of this to be organic. You all are here because you saw like an email or something on Facebook. But sometimes our friends do need a little bit of an extra push, you know. And I think it is I, one thing that I did realize: like, it's okay to ask for what you want. I think that was a big piece of what came out. Ask for what you want. Be clear on what you want, and and and. You know, if your friend, your friends are your friends, and you can say, "Hey, can I count on you to do?" This? We, two things that you may have noticed, right? Like Ishrak built a connection. That's the first thing of like making a hard ask. Was like, what is the thing? He asked me what my motivations were, right? He identified my, what my motivations were. He he related to my motivations, and he tied to a specific thing, action item that I can carry through with, right? So. Uh, that may, I apologize if that yeah. is not the best modeling and a bit uh, pushy on it, but I think as Farhan was mentioning, it's like being clear around to ask and being able to connect with individuals. So I'd actually just love for folks right now to kind of take like two minutes to brainstorm like five to ten names of folks that you think you should reach out to, even if it's not necessarily attending this training, but somebody that's within your network that you want to engage in the vision that you have. Um, and then particularly around the trainings, I'd love to just do a go around and kind of hear people's commitments around it if they're planning to uh, like attend or if they're planning to bring other folks to it or like if they're going to be reflecting on the material a bit more. The MCC. It will Absolutely. Be right. Yeah, the M the MCC trainings will be are being recorded, and I think they. I'm not sure what the timeline is, how long it'll take us, but I'll let you know certainly once it's done. I think it's being live streamed on it's being, Facebook. It is Facebook. being live streamed, but I think we'll also have the recording soon. Okay. Well, we'll see. Yeah. So then, in that case, maybe we'll just. I know we're like. Uh, if folks just want to, like, we'll do one go around and then we'll close with uh, uh, like uh, a takeaway that they got from this training yeah. and like an action that they're committing to doing. So, yeah, I did send um, the emails I received from my friend, his mom actually, and then nobody responded. So now I will actually put a little bit of my note that I attended it and I actually liked it and this is what I got from it. And then I hope you can join me. I will actually encourage some people to drive with me so that we have a little bit of car sharing. So yeah, so it was really good and I will try to bring more. Actually one of the Sunday school teacher in our Concord Masjid Clayton Road 
I send him the information thinking that the Afghan community will be more interested. So I will try to convince them also because like the um, brother was saying that if it is mentioned in the khutbah, not necessarily all of it, the, all information about the political engagement, but a little bit few lines at the end of the khutbah to um, encourage uh, Muslim community. That is the best time. Actually, the khutbah, time of the khutbah is the best time to tell people be involved with your greater community and your country. This is our country. Um, this was very helpful. I think it was good to get a lot of the practical strategies towards the end, especially. Um, I was, I don't know if next time we're going to focus more on the other ones, but, um, if we are, that'd be great. Some of the, like the community, I know we went through community relational power and there was a lot that related to community organizing, but if we did, if we're planning to like dig deeper into some of those um, other definitions and how practical strategies come out of those that I think that um, I mean that would be amazing um, but one of the things that um, I think our immediate next steps for us and Rashid's Rashid didn't mention it but he's on Muslims for Bernie too um, just to take the stuff that we learned about how to build those relational connections and then start implementing those um, and also um, I mean the interaction between you two looked uncomfortable but it reminds me of what Bernie says all the time, which is like this involves you stepping out of your comfort zone and initiating that uncomfortable conversation and sticking with it and getting something done from it. So that's it. It, it looked like it was supposed to feel partly uncomfortable, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Takeaway and uh, perhaps yeah, I, I think just in, in general, like I sort of reemphasize in my mind the importance of um, just utilizing your connections and your position and whatever kind of influence you have to sort of be a conduit for the values you care about. So I think um, it's what has motivated me to do is talk to a lot of my friends personally about this. I actually realized going to this event. I was like, I should have invited people, and I forgot to do that. Um, so that's um, something, inshallah, I won't forget next time. It's just you know, reaching out to a lot of people on social media and also through just like one-on-ones, um, and uh, making sure even at critical junctures, like when it's time to vote or when there's an important um, you know organization going on, um, there that we kind of show up and we we uh, make our voice heard. It's uh, it's kind of it's good to see the difference between I mean it's it's similar very much similar to the Christian it, the concept is from that you know all of us and it's good that I'm very happy to see that this is coming to MCC in the East Bay because I feel like we are uh, we're kind of hibernating and I, I wish we could do more I wish the leaders in the community uh, could do more I mean, they're doing more I think but the problem is people are not very receptive to the idea I mean here we have there's a huge community in here and this number showing up I'm sad and disappointed but at the same time I'm not surprised um, so I guess one takeaway was that like how when you're getting involved in a cause that uh, it's important to do one-on-ones and like assess the values and like the motivations for the individuals um, for getting involved and I've noticed that uh, as I'm starting out to like actually become civically and politically engaged that is what a lot, some of the friends that I've met 
do. That's like the first thing that they do. They like assess like what is it that's bringing me to the table. Um, so that was it's cool to see like this formalized structure and how it's being implemented in these circles. Um, and uh, I think uh, so. I I have like a group of uh, friends who like meet regularly for Halka and. Um, one of the things we were talking about are like these like bigger, broader issues that are uh, that our world is facing, like climate change. Um, and uh, we were thinking that rather than just like focusing on Quran, uh, it's it's important for us to like try to like take something away and like have an action each week. And um, we want to be more engaged, like civically engaged. So I'll I'll ask some of the members to come. So I'm taking away two main things. So one is about the relational aspect of, I mean, maintaining those relationships. So I'm making a determination to do better there instead of not contacting people for one year. <laughs> so, and then the other aspect is I'm building a base. So, and I'm actually volunteering right now that in case you want to do this drive and you need a representative in San Ramon, SRVI is all the more than happy to, to help to do that. I actually have a, an ask, if you don't mind me, because I, uh, a few, uh, and it has to do more, it'll be a good a prelude to your, uh, to your event. So, uh, I don't know how much you know about the Uyghur issue. I actually organized a conference about it just two weeks ago with the Northern California Islamic Council, and we brought in a lot of people who are from Uyghur uh, origin. So, bottom line, there's two legislations right now in Congress. One is, uh, uh, HR 649 and one is HR 1025. 1025 is a legislation suggested by Brad Sherman, who was a Democrat from the California, Southern California, which uh, actually acknowledges, first of all, that there is a real genocide happening in China against the Uyghur. And the Uyghur people are actually people who look like me, they don't look Chinese. It's just uh, they're East Turkmenistan, the old name for the nation. And that three million of them are in incarcerations and they're being forced to exit their religion, that their daughters are being taken and they're not changing only their religion, but they're changing their race by forcing them into marrying Han. Just to give you an idea, uh, a month and a half ago, 16 of these kids who were, were very religious girls finally accepted to marry a Han, which is a Chinese Chinese, or the one in exchange that uh, they would release their parents. Their parents were released, they were sent home, and with them there was sent a communist to make sure that they don't pray at night so that they really, really repented from this religion. All 15 girls killed themselves last month, committed a suicide after they freed their mothers and father because they were forced into marriage and a relationship with somebody who does not believe in God. So it's that severe, it's a real genocide. Uh, what are we doing about it? Absolutely nothing. Uh, so the Democrats have a legislation. It's being sponsored. There is a probably hundred. And uh, the Republicans have uh, Marco Rubio and another one by the name of Chris has another legislation, number 649, which actually has teeth and repercussions for China, including sanctions. There is a serious effort by the KRLA office to merge both of them so they will become one strong legislation sponsored by many. What's upsetting to me is that Barbara Lee, our congresswoman here, has asked many times that I help her in fundraising from the Muslim community, and she has not sponsored any of the two legislations. So the ask at the, this long introduction is that I get more people starting Monday calling her office and asking her after recess to go ahead at least sponsor one of them. Hopefully we'll be able to merge both of them. And that will be the work of what Polygon wants to ask you to do next month. So this is one ask. Another advertising is uh, uh, I have a nonprofit, and inshallah, in, in a couple of months, we'll be holding a very major 
event for the homeless in Auckland called Day of Dignity, a major mega event. And I would request if any of you would want to volunteer his time and effort, it'll be something that'll make you actually proud to be Muslim. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. What else? What am I asking? I ended up to. Provides quick context um, for next week. Um, so again, uh, I will um, I have all of your emails, so I'll email out um, once I have the link from the recorded training, things like that. Um, and if you did say that you wanted your contact shared, then I'll share your contact with everyone else in the room. Next week, again, is the legislative advocacy training. Um, we will have yeah, some more of the definitions, a little bit more uh, practice as well of how do you engage with an elected official, how do you make asks, things like that. Um, but if you have, I think, you know, it's a good thing that we have these series of three things strung together. If you want, if, if you have things from this week that you still kind of want to practice in the next week's thing, you know, this is, this a, a big piece of this is just like the community building aspect of it and getting a forum together where you all can practice. Um, and so we can carry some of that over potentially to next week as well. So um, you'll have my email um, if you want to email me with suggestions of what you want to do. We'll tailor that to what you want. Sound good? Okay. Allah, I pray that you allow for us to transform from our dormant state to an active state where we actually become living servants of you, living mu'mins of you, not just Muslims, but Muslim mu'mins. Oh Allah, I ask you to divorce us and divorce our hearts from the fear of everybody else and everything else but you. Oh Allah, allow us to transform from this colonial mindset to a free man and a free woman mindset, a mindset that makes us the pioneers of social justice, environmental justice, and economic justice. O oh Allah, I plead to you that you allow us to transform from the inside, to feel the necessity and the priority of really participating in our local communities, in civic engagement, and in our political participation. O oh Allah, bestow your mercy and allow for the blessings to be bestowed on all these two organizations who are here and make their, their efforts successful now and in the future. Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Wa anhi bi dua from the ayat al Quran. Wal asr inna al insana lafi khusr illa ladina amanu wa amalu salihat wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Ameen.